Welcome, everyone, to episode number 70. Only 30 more of these until I hit 100 and I can retire from BookTube. Uh, but tonight, episode 70, a special episode, I am joined by uh, someone who we've been playing tag and DMs for about a year and a half, I feel like. <laughs> no, uh, never it, it's been a while, and we really haven't got to catch up properly. So we're going to do that here tonight live for you all. And that is, of course, my friend Sarah Reeds. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? It has been such a long time. Episode number 42 was the last oh time you were gosh, on. Really? Yeah. You know, usually I try, but you know, Alan, obviously semi-permanent co-host, he's on like every five episodes or so. That's fair. That's fair. Uh, but you know, most people, I try to get them in twice a year for the people, you know, that, that want to come back and whatnot. And I looked at ours and I was like, wow, it's been well over a year then, right? It doesn't feel that long. Like it does feel like we've been messaging for a long time, but it doesn't feel like it's been a year since we did this. Yeah, looking here, it, it has been over a year wow. uh, since you've been on. And a lot has changed, I would say, since then. Um, you know, uh, I know that you took a little hiatus from BookTube, and now you've been yeah. back kind of doing the TBR thing. You did some pretty cool videos at the year end as well that we'll talk about. But, I, I mean, do you just not like me anymore? Like, what's the problem? <laughs> <laughs> right, I'm a, I'm a fake reader now. I don't I don't actually read books anymore. Oh, we're supposed to read them? I don't, I don't even touch them anymore. Like, I don't even pick them up. <laughs> I don't even pretend. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I just saw you post a book haul, so I don't think that that's, that's actually true. true. <laughs> um, so, so you did take a little break, but you're back. I mean, how, how does it feel after coming back from like a break from book two? Because I know it wasn't voluntary, right? It was because things got complicated. It, yeah, it was. It has been tough to get back into it, to be honest. Like I was very excited to do all of the end of the year stuff, but it's life has just been busy. So yeah. number one, there's been a lot of things that have been happening. And if, if you can see, okay, I never know which way to, like you can see the giant pile of boxes in the back of like, the back <laughs> our, our house is just a disaster because we're like slowly trying to renovate rooms. And it's just, it gets more complicated the older the kids get because the more like things they're doing and activities you have to bring them to. And it's just finding the time. And then sometimes when I find the time, I'm like, oh, I'm just I'm tired. <laughs> I want to <laughs> record something. And to be fair, I have also been doing more of other things. Like I've been writing more and I've been working out a lot more. Like that's something that I got out of um, nice. when I was studying for my residency exam. And I always did like a little bit, like I always did like a jog or a walk per day, but I've been getting more into the like resistance training and stuff again, just because when you hit 35, you kind of feel it. I'm like, I don't want to feel like this anymore. I need my joints to actually move the way that they're supposed to. So I had to really get back into it. And that takes, as you, as I'm sure, you know, that takes up a chunk of your time by the time you prepare, get ready. Do oh, certainly. Yeah. And yeah. I think, uh, so while you were out uh, away from book two, about that whole four months, I had staph infection and oh I wasn't gosh. able to do uh, jujitsu and, and a bunch of other stuff. Right. So in that time, I actually gained a lot of free time because now I didn't feel great that entire time, but I did have all this free time because about two and a half hours of my day freed up almost. And I was like, this is this is great. And now I'm I'm finally getting back to being healthy. And I'm like, do I really want to give away all that two and a half hours? Of <laughs> How now? healthy do I want to be? <laughs> yeah, it's like I lift uh, I lift six days a week, right? And I, I do some form of, of general cardio yoga. And then at night, I usually do jujitsu. But like lately, it's just been like one thing after another. And now I'm going back and I'm getting so sore that I can't make it to the second class. And then the third and the fourth and the fifth. And I'm like, hmm. Like maybe I should just leave my my evenings open. That might mm -hmm. make my life a little bit easier. It makes it easier to read multiple books at once because I can like segment time. Uh, I get to do other things like watch television, which I, I I'm not huge on, but and play a ton of uh, video games as well. So I I feel like I'm trying to find my balance of getting out of being a fitness fanatic, <laughs> and you're you're trying to find time for it. So we got to find a balance in between. That's true. Thing. Yeah, that's that's fair. Uh, I really like what Gavin said here. He said, coming back to BookTube after hiatus can be intimidating. Sometimes things change so quickly. How did you feel? Because you were gone for about, what, four months, three, four months? At least. I And even then, if you go back, like, for the past six months or so. Oh, there's a child who's sneaking in. Just give me one second. <laughs> You're totally uh, fine. You're talking to Jimmy. I'm talking to my friend. You're supposed to be in bed, honey. Where who? Jimmy. You can wave, but then you got to go up. There you go. Right, you go. <laughs> Everyone say hello. 
<laughs> you can't sleep. You go he, find me. He, he can hear you, but you can't hear him because I got headphones on. Go find daddy. He'll lie down with you, okay? If you're having a hard time sleeping. Can I go in your room? You can go in my room if you want to. Just close the door, please. So, Sorry. Such, such a good parent. So nice and, and <laughs> patient. My God. I'm, I am on camera. So. <laughs> See, that's why I like doing lives because anything can happen. Anyone that's can true. walk in the door. Maybe Alan's going to walk in next. <laughs> that's true. That's Could true. That'd be great. Uh, I so, am. So I am going to. Uh, I am doing a mini booktube meetup in November. I am going to Toronto, and I am going to see Anitha. And Evie has maybe promised to come, or at least hinted that she's going to come. So we'll see if oh that my. happens. Oh my goodness. Okay, um, a little meetup. I. Uh, I was looking at uh, Dragon Steel this year for book five of Stormlight and thinking about going out there. I have a hotel room reserved, but the, the more the more I look at how much this thing costs, I'm like, is it really worth it? Because I know it's going to happen. I'm going to get there and then everyone's just going to want to read Stormlight five in their hotel rooms because he's releasing <laughs> it there. And I'm not going to be that guy. Like, I'm going to want to like be social and I'm going to be like, guys, like, what are we doing? But they're everyone's readers, you know, introvert, extrovert kind of thing. So that would be the only book to meet up. I might possibly have. I also do have a, um, a surprise in the summer that I'm keeping under wraps. Ooh, exciting. An in-person episode of chatting with nuts should be happening this summer. That, that should be pretty special. And I might see Alan next month as well, but I don't think any of that will make it to, uh, to YouTube. So it's always fun getting to meet people, uh, you know, with similar passions and obviously involved in this entire YouTube thing. Definitely. I had a great time meeting Alan. He came up when I was in Florida. He came up for the day. Unfortunately, Christina had a concert, so she couldn't come with him, but he came up and we had lunch and played a bunch of board games. He brought them with him and Andrew and Alan and I played them in the hotel room and they both ganged up on me and, you know, made sure that it didn't matter which one of them won as long as I was the person who lost. Like they were instantly bonded in this, in this goal, which was, which was good. Yeah. If anything, Alan loves sabotage. There's no yes. doubt about it. Yeah. yeah. And Andrew loves sabotaging me. Like he's a very nice board game player to anybody else, but he has like said to me point blank, I don't care what happens as long as you don't win. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I ended up, always losing to Kelsey in any sort of board game ever. And she always pretends like she doesn't understand. And then she like slyly wins the game and it makes me infuriated. The entire time. Cause she's very smart mm -hmm. and she, she acts like she isn't. And I'm sitting, everyone's like, Oh, let's help her out. Let's give her some good cards. I'm like, she's playing all of you. I, I know it's going to happen. And it happens every single time. It's that's, that's, that's excellent. That's like a masterclass. Yeah, she's a, she's a deceiver and a lie and a cheat. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you you were saying that you were gone for three or four months, but really it was longer than that because you had had some like intermittent posting for about six. Yes, months. like before that, the posting was not regular. And to, and to be fair, the summer is difficult for me because the kids are home every day, and we are a like we are a minimal TV family. So when you have kids that are their age and you're not letting them watch a lot of TV, you got to entertain them. So it's, there's a lot of, you know, they do spend a fair amount of time outside, but in the summer it, it takes a lot of energy to entertain them. So we, yeah. it was difficult to get on booktube a lot in the summer. And then I thought, okay, well now the summer's over, I'm going to get back into it. And to be honest, like the end of the, the year was just a tough time. It was, you know, yeah. A lot, lot of stuff going on. It, it's a tough time for a lot of people, right? Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely. That, you know, when all hands are on deck and everyone re requires things of you uh, and it can be pretty tough. So did you, did you feel like in that little gap when you came back, like did things change here on book YouTube for you? Like, or it feels a little bit weird. And like, the, so discord helps, but even there, I feel like I, my friends keep it alive for me. Like they're so, they were so good about like keeping the chats alive and, and talking about things. And I felt like the most negligent discord owner because I would be popping in like occasionally and, it, it would be funny because everybody knows when I get online because I then answer like 40 different messages and then I'm getting all of these notifications of everybody <laughs> answering these different messages back to me. Um, but it does feel a little bit intimidating. Like you, as you know, these little social groups form and I felt like I was in the middle of 
several of those like social groups. And now it seems like there are other kind of social bubbles. Not that I think anybody has like forgotten or we're not friends or anything anymore. It's just that those relationships form and then you see, okay, well like now these same like four or five people are doing videos together and going on each other's channels. And I'm like, oh, I don't even know how to break back into this anymore. Yeah. And how do you approach it? Like, do you come back with a review of something or, you know what I mean? It, it can be a little bit difficult to figure out how to re-enter. Uh, Absolutely. Honestly, a lot of people, whenever they end up taking a break, what I've seen in the pattern, uh, at least in our sphere, is that it will usually be like, hey, I'm going to take a break. And then the person will attempt to come back. And then they post like one video and then you don't see them ever again. And it's kind of like they came back to see if they were still interested. And maybe it just was like, what am I doing? Uh, which is totally it's a hobby, right? People quit yes. hobbies all the time, which is totally acceptable. But for you, I mean, you have, you've been back, you've been posting book hauls, TBRs. You had a video that I loved and that was the five star showdown. That was so much fun. That was so fun to film. Can you explain to those who didn't get to see it, like what the idea was? And also I'd love to know where you got the idea from. Like, did it just pop out of the ether or? Um, where I feel like I must have seen something i don't think it was a booktube video like i think there was it was something completely outside of even books where they were doing a bracket to like narrow down their favorite something i was like what i i wish i could remember the thing that they were narrowing down um but i was like this would be really fun to do with books and especially since i didn't actually make that many videos at the end of the year people haven't heard me talk about a lot of these books so they won't mind if i do a couple of the same kinds of videos because usually i'm very cognizant of the fact that I don't want to repeat the same things over and over. Mm. And so I thought, you know, I could definitely do that this year because I haven't spoken about these books a whole lot. And <laughs> the spear cuts through water did get shafted, Evie, I'm sorry. Um, but it, it was really fun. I, uh, I had hoped to like pop up the little tournament bracket in the video, but I couldn't mm -hmm. make that work. I'm not very technologically advanced. Like we're, we're going to work some sound effects. I was impressed with the sound <laughs> effects. But basically what it was, it was just a tournament bracket. And I put in every book that I gave five stars in 2023. I randomized them. So like, I'm pretty sure the, the one and two didn't even make it all the way through to the end. Um, and then just let them face off against each other. And it was fun, but also, you know, sad because then you have to get rid of books where you're like, this definitely is not as good as one of these ones that made it all the way through, but that's the way that, it goes. Yeah. That's why I kind of liked it because the things that bubbled up through the tournament necessary, like didn't necessarily mean that they were in that order, but the matchups dictated it. I, I think it's actually a really fun thing to do. Uh, I may ask you if I can borrow that idea down the road at some point. Cause I think definitely. it just looked like a lot of fun to be honest. Uh, it, it was pretty cool to watch. And, uh, someone was asking for about your book of the year, which I think came down to the Chinese fantasy book that I'm forgetting yes. the name of. Yeah, Can you called... tell everyone about this book? Because <laughs> you you seem to be like very high on this book and I've never heard of it. So I think like, the, re the issue is that like it is a book that I love, but like literally no one who watches my channel would like it. So you have to be a very <laughs> particular kind of person. To you have like a couple of spicy takes on that list. <laughs> Right. So it, it's it's fantasy romance, essentially. So there's like this whole subgenre of Chinese fantasy romance and they become really big because there's a company now that's publishing them in North America. So they actually they already had a lot of fans in China and worldwide because they make Chinese dramas of them. So I know like everybody talks about K-dramas. So there's also C-dramas or Chinese dramas. And so a couple of these books have been made into really popular Chinese dramas. And so then once that popularity came, so I think it was kind of a perfect, um, the timing was perfect for one of them. So one of the, mo the her most well-known one in English is called Grandmaster of Demonic Cultivation. And a Chinese drama called The Untamed came out during COVID. So everybody was trapped in their house during COVID. This drama came out and it caused like this huge sensation. Um, and so then there people were like, okay, there's a market for this kind of book. And they became published and then they became bestsellers. So they started publishing more and more. And it's just like, if you are the kind of person like me who enjoys that not only fantasy romance, but like the type of romance that feels like fan fiction, like this is again, <laughs> this is not a book I'm going to get on my channel and be like, everybody read this book. You're gonna I don't know if you're it. selling like, it. I'm going to be honest. I, <laughs> no, you're not going to love it. I love it. But if you love that, then then you would love this. And I do. So that is that is what appeals to me about it. It's just like the most 
it's like those dramas, right? If you could think of the most over the top antics that you can think of, like the the stakes are really high and there's a lot of like terrible things that are happening. And then <laughs> with this like undercurrent of romance underneath it all. So it was very appealing to me, but, and it does have giant appeal. It's just that in this little fantasy niche that we have cultivated, that we are a part of, mm. nothing is going to have the most appeal to, to those viewers. You know, I like that. You're just saying it with your chest though. You're like, no one's going to like this. However, it's okay. <laughs> That's <laughs> kind of how I felt whenever uh, two years ago when I gave the third book of the sequel series in our Scott Baker series. I'm like, 90% of you are going to absolutely think this is, you know, dog shit. But, but for me, amazing. Right. Loved it. <laughs> right. Except for yours, you know, I think it's a little bit more lighthearted. Mine makes people look at me a little bit differently. They're like, cannibalism. Really? I'm like, yeah. What is wrong? with this man <laughs> yeah it's you know it's it's like owning berserk you kind of keep them on the high shelves hope no one flips them open when they come over i did see some berserk on your shelves but i saw a lot of things on your shelves that i was super curious about because you're shooting in the new area like you said you're, you're yes it's just in my room this is my like tbr shelf in my in my bedroom yeah you had a bunch of stuff behind you and i'm trying to recall well, obviously i saw the berserk but i also saw witch king by martha wells back there have you read that I haven't. So I bought it because funnily enough, a lot of people, when it was first being announced, a lot of people were like, this sounds a lot like Grandmaster of Demonic Cultivation. And I think Mar Martha Wells is known to be a fan of that book series. Like she has read it and talked about it before. And so before it had come out, there was a lot of buzz in that part of the internet that I spent time on. And I was like, oh, cool. I'll check it out and see how similar it is. But then it came out and almost everybody hated it. So I was like, oh, well, I guess this is going to the bottom of the, <laughs> of the TBR. So I haven't read it yet. But uh, yeah, I, I have heard that it was not great, but I'm still, you know, I might like it. Yeah, so, yeah. I'm just kind of curious because Martha Wells obviously is very popular for the murder bot stuff. And that is never called to me, to be honest. I've just never really been all that interested in it. And then Witch King just out because, you know, who doesn't love a good king in fantasy, but also witches so underused in fantasy mm -hmm. nowadays, I feel. Or if they're used, it's like, a throwaway like oh there was a side character witch and she was in the woods and that da, 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 da. like i want some powerful witches you know right. like actually in power i think that would be amazing gavin says this is hilarious sometimes i subscribe to someone from their shelves alone and sarah <laughs> was an instant subscribe i agree but was it these shelves or was it that shelf that's the question <laughs> i mean yeah you've had such a variety <laughs> it was just so wild um oh also, the bat <laughs> yeah, the bat plus me that was on. I also thought that that was uh, fairly adorable. Um, it's very cute. Evie sent it to me. It is uh, it is really cute. Yes, I'm sending you a whale plushie. See, my friend Julia gives me a whale-themed Christmas gift every year. And so my and my husband doesn't like bacon, which has become this like running thing in our friend group because they're like, who doesn't like bacon? And Andrew's like, me, I guess. So every year she gets me a whale-themed gift and Andrew a bacon-themed gift. <laughs> been that way for years <laughs> i respect that you know yeah. that just shows you that your friends are listening to you when yeah they talk. she's got commitment to the bit <laughs> <laughs> chadia says which king sounds cool jimmy but it is not and that's what i've heard from all almost everybody yeah and Cade says wells is a favorite of mine i love the books of raxora but I bounced so hard off Witch King. I felt like it very hard to connect to. So apparently this book is not good. I'm glad that you're going to fall on the spear for me. You're uh, welcome. I immediately put it on my TBR whenever I saw it on your show. And I'm that immediately going to take it off after this. So. Someone did tell me it's a bit like Locked Tomb. Like you spend the first, or specifically like Gideon, like you spend the first, I don't know, 60% of the book not knowing what's happening. And then things become clearer after that. And I was like, I'm okay with that. I am definitely an along for the ride kind of person. Things don't need to be clear from the beginning. I'm okay being confused. Sometimes I'm in the mood to be confused and sometimes I'm not. So I just, uh, I'm a, I'm a big David Mitchell guy now after reading just one book of his and I started cloud Atlas and the first 39 pages make up kind of like a part one. And it was the most confusing thing I've read in so long. And it's so weird because his other book wasn't confusing at all to me, really, besides like a couple little of the magical things. It's kind of breadcrumbed. But I was like really having a tough time. It was essentially a guy from San Francisco uh, in the mid 19th century uh, that had went to like kind of like Aboriginal islands out in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And it was written in that that style that they would have talked back then. And I 
I just wanted to stab my eyes out listening to it, I are reading it. I was like, I am so confused. I hate the way this dude's talking. And I was, I just felt weird because I just finished book of the new sun, which was confusing as all get out. And I loved it. Mm -hmm. I guess it's just a mood thing for me. Now I will say this cloud Atlas part two has already started off on a heater, a uh, very unself aware POV. That seems like a scoundrel. So I'm very excited about that, but nice. Which you know, being got made into a movie, which David Mitchell book. It was Cloud Atlas. Tom oh, Hanks. Okay. Is, it's one of four movies he ever made that he considers to be good, actually, which is kind wow. of a weird thing for Tom Hanks to say, considering <laughs> that he's made some bangers uh, right. in in his de day. Alan says, "Be please, uh, please be sure you pile your tribute in a neat pile in the corner. I don't want to trip. My servants will be by to transfer it later." <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Uh, so one of the things that I noticed about your bookshelf was all the variety. And you seem to be someone like myself who likes a variety of stuff to read. Like you don't yes. just, you have your, your favorites, right? And I know that you love fantasy, but you read a ton of stuff. So what is it about variety that makes it so important to you? Is, is that how you are in everything in life or just reading? Yeah, I think so. I think it's, it's good to have, to have a balance. I, number one, my attention span is not great. I have been fighting against it my whole life. So I, I, come off as a very put together person, but I'm, I'm not. And I have to work really hard to try to be. So organization was a necessity and I need I need to be doing different things all the time. And, and my hobbies are usually pretty short lived. So booktube has lasted a long time for me. Mm -hmm. And it, it, I'm getting distracted now by Alan's message. And that's <laughs> the same in books. I definitely have gone through cycles. So when I was a kid, I read mostly fantasy because that's what I had at home. Then when I went to university, I read a lot of literary fiction, Canadian lit, because I went to a Canadian university. And then when I left, when I went to med school, I read a lot of YA because med school was really hard and time consuming and YA is very easy to flip through and read. And then when I left med school, I hadn't read fantasy in a long time. So I got back into reading fantasy and mostly read fantasy, but now I feel like I am falling behind in other things. So I guess it's two part. Like I have this weird perfectionistic streak that I've tried my entire life to get rid of to, you know, varying degrees of success. And I just, I don't like missing out on the things that are making a buzz. Like whatever Alan is where he doesn't want to read the things that are popular. I am the opposite. Like when people <laughs> are talking about something, I want to read it. And it's like that for all genres. So I'll be like, well, I need to read this work of nonfiction. Everybody's talking about it. I need to read this historical fiction. Everybody's talking about it. And I want to know why it's really good. Yeah. I think being, a, especially when you know that there's a lot of voices around that, as long as they're not too, uh, off-putting or so obnoxious that you don't want to join the conversation yes uh i think it's fun to kind of having a, an opinion you know it, make, it makes talking to other people easier too uh alan says your friendship is over just <laughs> <telling> you know <laughs> and rogue says sarah has uh not perfected the art of not being perfect <laughs> um, i'm with you I, I i know what you mean there are some things that call to me whenever they have buzz and one of the things right now and I, I'm, I'm afraid to admit this right now on a live. But my wife is reading the third book of the Crescent City by Sarah J. Mass, Sarah whatever the third J. book, Maslin. whatever that series is called. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And she has just had so much fun reading them. And mm -hmm. I and I'm like, I would like to know if I would have. I know I'm probably not going to like it, Why? but I, I want to do it so I can talk to her. And also they did a midnight release for this thing. And I thought it was a local bookstore. It's kind of new. I was thinking like, oh, that's a mistake. That's kind of, it's going to be like four people. It was so many people. And this happened with the, the second, fourth wing book too. There was like 50 people there. Yes. Like, this is crazy. Yeah. Uh, so there is a hundred percent part of me that at least wants to give SJM a shot. So my sister is a huge Sarah J. Mass fan. And so she's read all of them. I've only read the Throne of Glass books, which I did like. The first one was not great, but I did feel like they improved over time. As the series went on, I liked them more and more. I tried to read the Akatar ones and I couldn't. I could not get through the first one, but Crescent City and Akatar blend together like they are. Yeah. And I think actually Throne of Glass gets in there a little bit too. So when my sister was reading the third book and she rarely reads, she was sending me messages. She was sending me like voice messages. She was like, I can't. And like, she'd like, I, she would call me and then she'd be like, I gotta hang up. I gotta keep going. So like, she was, <laughs> she was definitely like the target demographic, like the tears, the, the everything she was, she was really into it. Dude, Kelsey finished book two and she's like, are you going to read these? I'm like, I might. She's like, damn it. 
She's like, I don't have anyone to talk about this. And then she couldn't sleep. And she was like, the third book comes out Tuesday. I wonder if I can get it early. Some and like, and then we were going to uh, Puerto Rico, so she wasn't going to be here for the book release. She's like, should I pre-order it? And I was just like, man, I miss those days. Like, I miss that kind of reading experience. Uh, right? And I don't Feeling get that. so swept up in it all. Yeah, it's it's fun to get hyped. And unfortunately, my favorite authors are dead or don't write, so <laughs> I'm kind of screwed when it comes to new <laughs> release hype. <laughs> Uh, Joanna says she read both and neither worked for me, but I might try throwing a glass. Joanna, I feel like you've, you've done, you gave it a shot. You can probably you your, just talk it. Best. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Benjamin. Noah says my wife fell back in love with reading because of Akatar, And it's been amazing because we spend more time reading together. Got to give SJM awesome. props for that. Yeah. Awesome. And that, that's the thing, you know, we don't frown on people who got into reading back in their teens due to Harry Potter or because of something like a miss more or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't frown on anything that gets people back into reading. And I know for a fact that Kelsey has accidentally found a coworker that also loves the Sarah J mass novels. And because of that, Kelsey has been reading like far seer and some other stuff. She's actually thinking nice. about starting stormlight and I'm trying to get her to read Molasson. That's like my, my end game. It's your ultimate goal. That's my ultimate goal. But she is now like recommending those things. And she's like reconnecting with people that she knew back in the day through college and stuff that she played sports with. And, you know, it's just, I don't know. It, it, it's a really big gateway that can open up. I know that there are people who say that they do not believe that Sarah J mass leads to people reading fantasy. And I disagree hard wholeheartedly just because I have so much anecdotal evidence, uh, which, you know, anecdotal evidence can be dangerous, but in this regard, I don't really care. I'll say it with my chest. Uh, I think that and it's is probably going up against no evidence at all. So. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I agree. I agree with that. I think it's most likely just hunches that that might be incorrect. Um, so for for me, I, I think it's kind of a good thing. And I, I also do enjoy uh, talking with my wife about books because she is not in our sphere. She doesn't really go on Goodreads, anything. So everything she says is 100 percent her. An original even when she reads books that i like like farseer mm -hmm. i give zero indication what i feel or every because i want to hear her take what she thinks and it's it. refreshing it's yeah, honestly awesome. really refreshing um it's one of those things where like if i did end up reading something from like let's say a sarah j mass um i probably don't i don't i don't know how much i would talk about on the channel like other than maybe hey i read it i thought it sucked or i thought it was great or whatever uh but i know the conversations with her would be really cool absolutely yeah, I uh, <laughs> I feel like as soon as I uh, mentioned Sarah J. Mass, the chat just kind of exploded. <laughs> so much That's the thing when something's popular. Also, everyone does happen to uh, an opinion. Yeah, which is fine, right? Um, so reading with Rebecca Nicole says I'm considering reading SJM and Fourth Wing because I want to discuss what the difference is between romanticy and fantasy with romance. I'm not convinced that there is one. Uh, I, it feels like it'd probably be semantic. I, I, I don't know where I stand off the top of my head. I imagine that it probably doesn't matter too much. I'm not really big on putting things into a box, you know, mm -hmm. um, but maybe they're different. I don't know. Alan says, I love the new release hype. I hope to be a part of it someday. Dude, KJ Parker releases a book like every other day. No one's hyped though. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> that there does require, hey, you know, more people are reading K.J. Parker. You you love The Folding Knife. Which I I'm, did. It was so good. Alan told me that that would be the best one to start with, and it came up on my Patreon wheel in December when I picked three books. I think I picked three. Mm -hmm. The Folding Knife is fantastic. And so actually, good. if I look at the last three months of my reading, like if I go back to December and start there, I have been reading a lot of really mediocre stuff lately. And mm -hmm. The Folding Knife is standing out more and more that it's just so well done and so well written and it's so difficult to recommend because it's like oh yeah no action happens <laughs> it's essentially just a guy being faced with a problem solving the problem somehow it turns out good for everyone even though he didn't have that intention in mind that's it that's right. you like fantasy oh well this is economics with a sociopath as a, as a main character <laughs> yeah <laughs> how are you gonna sell it to people but it's it, if you click with it, even when I when I read it, I was like, you know what? Lots of people are not going to like this. But I think if you do like it, you're going to really like it. There's I, th I don't think there's going to be a lot of like I felt mediocre about this book. Like either you find it really yeah. fascinating or you're like, oh, this is. This yeah, is to much. me, 
I, I think if you're in a, in a rush, it's probably not going to be like your favorite book of all time. But if you're willing to just go sit in somebody's head that is way more capable than you. And I think it probably helps that KJ Parker is also extremely intelligent and yes. knows a lot about everything. Uh, as mm -hmm. Alan always says, if you want to know exactly how something works, Parker's going to tell you like he will do that. Uh, and that was the that was the case for Folding Knife. But what a just fantastic book. I could have read 300 more pages of it easily. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, I'll be curious to see what you think of other KJ Parker because the company was very well written. It just didn't, it wasn't for me. I don't even know if that's, I think I had wrong expectations. I think if I reread it, I'd like it a lot more. But uh, I feel like I got to get on the novellas so I can talk to Alan about them because he's read like all of them. Yes, I also have the first Walled City book. I don't know what the consensus uh, is on that 16 one. 16 Ways to like Defend it. the Walled City. Is yeah, that right? I have I the first good one. good things about it. I feel like I always hear good things about it. Do you? Yeah. yeah. And then I have the collection. Is it a novella collection or short story? Collection? It's a novella collection, right? I don't know. I have, we'll say I have access to one of those. <laughs> it is not, it's very difficult to find in Canada, but I have. You, you wrangled have, it in. You have a secret yeah. stash of KJ Parker. <laughs> I found a sub press of a short story collections randomly nice. at my used bookstore. And it was, a, it was like 12 bucks. And I was like, well, I'm going to buy it because it's a sub press edition. And that was actually before I had read folding knife, uh, which I was like, I don't know when I'll read this, but now I'm like, I'll probably read this a lot sooner <laughs> than, than I would have before. Jared says new David Mitchell novel in 2025. So some of your favorite writers still write Jimmy. That is true. But even David Mitchell, you know, he's not releasing one every, uh, every two years. But he also takes a lot of time to write. I was gonna say his, his books would be difficult to produce one every two years, I would imagine. Yeah, I did a discussion on bone clocks with Joanna and fantasy awash this past week. And I, I, I had it like in the bottom half of my top 10, because I wasn't sure how much recency bias was playing into it. But it's been a few months now. And after discussing the book with them, I realized that the book is not only as good as I thought it was, but it's actually far better. I think it's, I think it's a masterpiece. And I use that word very sparingly for the most part. Uh, I think that that book might be a masterpiece. I wish I would have ranked it a little bit higher uh, in my top 10 books, but whatever it kind of. I also think it's possible. And this is a, a conversation that everybody has their own opinion on, but I think it is possible to believe that a book is one of the best books that you have ever read, but also not feel like it was your favorite book of that year, or maybe not even in your five favorite books of the year, because what makes you enjoy something is not always a, a measure of how objectively good it is. But then you also have a bunch of people who are like, you can't objectively measure how good a book is, which is true. But I think there are parts of a book that can make you understand the person who wrote it was in absolute of command of their craft, right? Like the, from yeah. the dialogue to the characterization, to the prose, everything is done as well as that person could do it. And you appreciate that, but maybe it's not your favorite book and that's fine. Yeah. There's tons of times where I read stuff and I'm like, so much work went into this and I am a piece of human garbage for not liking this <laughs> and not caring at all this is a me problem yeah this is how i felt about uh whenever i listen to people talk about uh the richard swan series because i like justice of kings Tyrion of faith was okay and i'm in the third book now and i'm i'm on the fence i, I don't know which way i'm gonna go i think i like it more in book two but you know a lot of what people really like about it is all the historical influences on it and i'm just like they mean nothing to me because i don't know any of that i'm this glad is, that you did my knowledge base. Yeah, like I'm glad he's super well versed. You know, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people read uh Philip Chase's books and don't realize how much knowledge Philip Chase has put into those books with old English inspirations and all that stuff. I mean, he's a medievalist. Of course he knows Absolutely. a bunch of stuff, right? Uh and I'm sure there's a lot of that stuff that just kind of goes over people. So I, as an author, I imagine it's frustrating. <laughs> you're like, I did all of this and you're hung up on my word choice because I said moist. And I'm like, yeah, dude. He said, not, <laughs> not Philip, of course, Mirakami and moist go hand in hand. Unfortunately, uh, Alan says, yes, I have a folding table outside of Barnes and Noble in celebration. People come by and tip over my decorations. <laughs> I would pay good money <laughs> to do that to you. Murphy says, Corey says, hi, I do not. Hello, Corey and not Murphy. It's a, uh, <laughs> it's wonderful to see you. Bojack Horseman says, finally reading the faithful and the fallen. I can't not believe it took me this long. Well, I'm glad that you are reading it and that you're having a good time. I have heard a rumor that Amazon has posted that the third book in the Bloodsworn trilogy might be coming out later this year, but Amazon has been known to 
put things up that aren't factual. Uh, it's been a little bit quiet on the Gwen front from what I know, waiting for that third book. So could be something to get excited about. We're talking about hyped release. It's not going to be a uh, New York Times bestseller, but in our sphere, people will be very, very excited. People will be excited. Yeah. Oh, welcome, Bookborn. She said, if it makes my eye, me roll my eyes, it's romantic. <laughs> if it doesn't, it's fantasy with romance. Clearly objective. I think that's... It's think actually peer-reviewed criteria. So. <laughs> yes. Yes, it is. I'm not opposed to uh, either romantic or... or uh, romance in my fantasy i guess it all just depends on on how it's done right it's done. yep yeah i think guy gravel k has a ton to say about romance in his fantasy and sometimes it plays out in some very odd sex scenes which is fine you know that's what he wants to do he can he can do that thing you read under heaven last year and you loved it right i did, I did love it that book is so good and that's yes. one of like i always say i think that might be the best ggk i've read even though my favorite is song for a bond I think mm -hmm. Under Heaven might be the most impressive from him. It was excellent. I loved it from the beginning to end. And it just builds and builds and builds. And then the ending is so good. And there's so much payoff. And I just feel like, speaking of someone who has command over language and how that translates, not just into beautiful prose, but in a perfectly executed scene, I will never forget reading the scene in Under Heaven where they meet the emperor for the first time. And just how GGK was able to convey how terrifying that was for an everyday citizen, even someone who has the prestige that the main character now has and has the wealth that he now has. Yeah. It was just, it was such a perfectly executed scene. And I think just, excuse me, culturally, it's also really hard for us to understand because we don't have any kind of equivalent. Like there's nothing that we can relate to that experience. And it was, it was so good. I, as I was reading, I was like, this is, he's such an amazing writer. Like, even if I yeah. don't love every book that I read by him, which who knows, like I've only read a couple, he, he just knows how to pull those things off so well. And he's able to get those emotions through without ever being dramatic. It's always understated mm -hmm. and perfect. Yeah, I think uh, the only time where I kind of felt that teeter for me was in Tagana. There were times where I felt like what the stakes were given in the book, I never felt them. And that was the only time that's ever happened to me. I still think it's a really wonderfully written book. Uh, it just didn't click with me. But he does have this sense of like gravitas to titles and to locations that he mm -hmm. really just puts them over. And some of my favorite fantasy, I think has that trait about it, that they're able to actually give this grand feeling to what is important. That's something A Song of Ice and Fire, I think, does very well. I think Wheel of Time actually does it exceptionally well with settings, uh, even though that's not my favorite series by any means or any stretch of the imagination. And it's something that I feel lately when I've been reading uh, fantasy, some of it happens to be newer, just doesn't have that levity to it for some right. reason. And that's what makes Guy Garvel K so special. And I'm reading Sailing to Serantium in March. I'm reading I'm... it right now. Wait, really? Yeah. How far are you in? I'm not very far. I'm just at the prologue. Like I've I've just started it. I'm reading a couple of different things right now. So I have started Ship of Destiny, which I started at the beginning of the month and have not been mm. reading enough of. And Sailing <laughs> to Serantium and The Dispossessed. So I'm reading all of them right now. I'm doing a... Kyle and Jake picked out a bunch of books for me to read this month because I had a really good time when I did it last year with Alan. And also, obviously, I wanted to pit my friends against each other and see who picked better books for me. So was it Alan or was it Jake and Kyle? And so I'm reading those. <laughs> do not do what you're about to do. <laughs> so I'm, I'm reading those right now. And I'm, I like all of them. They've, they've been good so far. Yeah, I, I feel like you've been reading Live Ship for five years. I have. I have actually been reading for two years. So yeah, what, what, what's what's the problem? Like, I don't get it. I honestly don't know either. So at first it was, it's going to sound so stupid because it is. So at first the like, the copy that I had was so tightly bound that I was like, this is annoying for me to read. I hate it. It's so heavy. It's so big. I don't want to <laughs> pick it up. They are humongous. They're big and like the Farseer books I had in mass market paperback, which was actually a lot easier because you can flop them around a bit. Like even though they're giant mass market paperbacks, I just feel like they're more maneuverable. But those like UK 
trade paperbacks are like the binding on UK books is like, I don't know what they put in there, but like, it's like cement or something. It's so hard <laughs> to open them up. Yeah. Brits, what's going on over there? So, and then I took a break from it, I guess. I don't know why. And I don't know. This happens sometimes when I really like things is I think it's some sort of like psychological block where I'm like, I don't want it to be done. So I actually will put off doing it for such a long time. And I don't know why, but I really do need to read it. It might not get finished this month. I'm just going to put that out there for everybody because I need to finish the books that Jake and Kyle told me to read, but I, it will be finished, Evie and everybody in March. <laughs> I will rate it. I will review it, I'm sure. And, you know, I, uh, I, I promise it will be finished. <laughs> well, uh, you're, you're catching some heat. Alan's furious that, <laughs> that you're having to even compare other people to his recommendations. And then, I mean, the folding knife, by the way, has to have some weight in, in that. It was email. excellent. Alan gave me lots of good books to read. Like the folding knife. I gave five stars guards, guards. So fun. Like I didn't think I was going to like any Discworld book more than I liked the death books and guards, guards was excellent. So good. Ogres by Adrian Tchaikovsky was great. Like that was a phenomenal novella. I always like it when people go second person. Like if you're bold enough to pull off something that's written in second person, I'm probably going to like it because you have taken some risks. So the only thing is that he also told me to read Sunless Ends, which I didn't like. And I DNF'd the sharp book that he told me to read. So he's got, you know, <laughs> I know I haven't read Men at Arms. That's true. I don't own any of the Discworld books and I have really been trying to read books that I own. I've been working really hard. It's so hard. I literally said I was going to do that. And then I just ordered a new book uh, the other day. And I was like, I'm going to read all from my thing. But I, I broke and I bought this because it was supposed to be like this post-apocalyptic African fantasy uh, written by, uh, I'm going to forget her name, uh, Nanetti Orkafor, I think yeah. is her name. And it sounded so interesting. And I guess she's written other books in, in the series. And actually Murphy is supposed to read the novella uh, that she released in 2021 that ties into this book that she wrote back in 2011. Uh, so I already broke my promise to myself. I was going to try to read all my own books, but it, it didn't, it didn't happen. Already done. Yeah. You've already failed. <laughs> Alan says, Oh my gosh, Jared's gray block name. Every time speaks hits me with a fr uh, refresh of how, <laughs> how much lower my status is. <laughs> Why have you not read men at arms yet? That's, I again, I think it's just because I don't, I don't own it. I don't know. I, I do. I love the Discworld books. I truly do. But it, I don't know, Jimmy. I don't have any answers to any of these questions. Why'd I come here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you didn't know you're gonna be put on trial. trial tonight. I mean, there's so many books that I've been talking about reading forever, so I totally get it. But I do think your live ship uh, progress is unacceptable. It and is and offensive. It, it, really it is true. Yeah, I, I'll take that. It's because it is the truth. <laughs> Well, I am glad that you're enjoying it, and I'm really glad that you're enjoying Sailing to Serantium. In this just pool of mid that I've been swimming through and below average books, I'm hoping that Sailing to Serantium will be like the one to pull me out. I'm also reading In Ascension uh, at the end of February, probably the last week of February, mm -hmm. which was uh, listed for the Booker Prize. So I think that's going to be cool. It's like a first contact sci-fi story, a little bit more literary. I guess it has to do with like oceanography, which is really cool. Uh, so I'm, I'm actually pretty excited about that as well. It's cool. If you're not scared of the ocean. Uh, well, yeah, for you, you're out. Like I couldn't imagine anything less. I don't know if there's whales, but I'm going to assume there's whales because whales are probably aliens. Let's be honest. Alan is mad that I'm in the middle of a buddy read. Alan, this has nothing to do with, with you and me buddy reading, but the third book in Richard Swan series I'm, I'm up in the air. I'm liking it. But there were some parts already that I'm like, why is this in this book? <laughs> it made me so upset. However, uh, I do like it more than book two so far, which is great because book two is a bit of a disappointment uh, for me. Not that it was terrible. I just thought th the thing about this Richard Swan series, and I know, Sarah, you probably do not care about this uh, presently because you're not reading it. But it's just like one of those stories. That started I read the out, first one. Sorry. It, it's like, oh, OK. So it started out and I loved it. And it just went a totally different way than I thought it was going to go. And that doesn't mean that it's bad, but I've had to like pull myself back and be like, okay, like he's going to tell me a different story and that's okay. Um, but man, this third book is wild. It is like me and Alan are about 50%, I think maybe a little further than that. I think we are. And we're both like, it feels like we're at the end of the book. Like so much stuff has happened. 
and it's been good. There's just this one part that me and Alan both were like, what is this? Yes. Like, why is this in this book? It's just, this doesn't actually uh, fit. So that is when I'm talking about mid books, I'm really talking about Miss Born Air too, because mm -hmm. yeah, I, I just, I don't get it. <laughs> I did, I haven't had, did, have you read air too? I don't air my Brandon Sanderson opinions uh, in public. <laughs> okay. I respect that. <laughs> I'm I, kidding. No, I haven't read Miss Born Era 2. My dad loves them though, because he likes Westerns and he likes goofy humor. So he is a big fan of Era 2. I uh, I had hard enough time getting through Era 1, to be honest. And, and even... I'm, I'm not supposed to say much about the books that I have read this month because it's supposed to be Kyle and and Jake find it out at the end of the month, but I, they got me to read the emperor soul. And I will say that on the very first page, I opened it up and I read, Oh, the background is disheveled. We're doing like renovations. It's wild in here. I'm sorry. Um, but I opened the first page of the emperor soul. And I was like, this is why I hate your writing. Brandon Sanderson. I'm sorry. Like it just it was like staring me in the face from the very first page. But I think that he has amazing ideas. He is, so imaginative. His books are really cool. He is a master of the, that kind of like falling action. And those are all great characteristics. And for some people, I'm sure his writing is great, but there's something about it that infuriates me. I hate it. And it is really <laughs> hard to get past it. <laughs> well, you're going to make me look like a good guy. So this is actually much needed. Uh, this is fantastic. Um, everyone boo Sarah. <laughs> Yeah. Leave me, kick, me, leave me alone. Me now. <laughs> um, I liked Emperor's Soul. I actually, I actually thought that that was his best writing uh, that, that I had read. And I really enjoyed it. The one thing that I've been kind of impressed with in Era 2, and one of the very few things that I've actually enjoyed about the series, is it is remarkable how well he mixes his magic into his plots, worlds, and characters, and lives. Like, all that stuff, I, I give it up. To, and I'm not just talking about hard magic system, blah, 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 that stupid conversation. Like, he just makes it matter. And that's really cool. Like yes. magic matters in many, many of the best series. And I think that that's one of the talents that he really does have. And he doesn't shy away from it, which is also cool. Like he's not trying to play this. Like, I don't want to be too magic -y because that's going to turn off, you know, the moms and pops that flip open my books. I like that he embraces it. And that's been the coolest thing about Miss Born Era too so far. And that's, that's about it. I'm not sure if I'm going to read, I'm definitely going to try the lost metal, but I'm going to, uh, I'm going to give it like 50 pages. And if I can't stand it anymore, I'm just going to read the wiki and be a, a hater. That's probably just going to be what I. What That's I what you're going to do. Sanderson is an author because I've read some books where I'm like, how do people like this? Please tell me the thing that people like about this because I cannot understand it in any part of my brain. With Sanderson, I do understand what people like about it. It's not that I read it and I'm like, oh, I don't understand how he became so popular. I do understand it. Like there he has strengths and they have mm. mass appeal but it is very difficult for me to get past his prose and i understand that i read romance and so people are going to be like yeah you definitely are the person that we're going to listen to but i think that there is a time and place for different styles of writing I and agree. if i read a fantasy novel that was written like some of the romance novels that i read i wouldn't like it i like it in the context that it's given you know it's i get what i show up for and i i just don't like the way that brandon sanderson writes it baffles me that he teaches writing courses like it it absolutely baffles me which is gonna sound really mean about brandon sanderson i'm so sorry i i you people can love it i'm sure lots of people do love it this is the meanest canadian appearance i've ever had actually i know i'm uh, the meanest canadian <laughs> you are the meanest canadian i know <laughs> do you have a bias against utah is that it you just don't like where he's from is that yeah. Okay. Yeah, definitely. No, actually, there's a really cool, um, I think it's in Utah, there's like this really cool, like role playing park, like theme park for people who like doing LARPing in Utah, I think that oh, is no. located in Utah. Oh, you got to watch this. Uh, so I think it's Jenna Nicholson or Jen Nicholson. She does uh, YouTube content. She's fantastic. And she went there. And mm -hmm. it's all a farce. It's oh, like yeah. nothing like what they, Sarah, I almost booked tickets to this right before COVID <laughs> and I didn't go. And I'm so glad I didn't because when I watched, she did like a three or six hour or something like that breakdown of this place. And yeah, Jenny Nicholson. Thank you, dude. 
Evermore is the park name. Thank there you, Mandalorian. We go. Yes. It was supposed to be this, like, you go and you do an RPG and you make choices and talk to these NPCs. It looks so cool. Oh, my God. The website was fantastic. Turns out it's complete. Oh, wow. So many other people <laughs> have watched it. Yeah, it's, it oh, is amazing. great. I'm telling you all, I, it, when you finish this tonight or if you're watching after, go watch that video. Because when you see what is promised and then what they deliver, it is the most... <laughs> disappointing thing in the world and uh, to link this to brandon sanderson that wired article that everyone got mad about i'm pretty sure whenever that guy went to the sanderson thing that sanderson took him not because he thought it was cool but it was just like something to do i'm pretty sure they went to that park like with that journalist which is kind of interesting wow um, yeah J uh, J uh she's fantastic by the way what a what a fantastic um <laughs> uh matt said i didn't even know sarah was kidding until she said sorry uh, I clearly haven't heard me say TBR before. I say you haven't watched a TBR video because she's like, oh, it's my TBR. And I was like, she did it. She said it again. It's the Leonardo DiCaprio meme where he points at the TV. Yeah. Every time. I'm sorry. Every single time you do it. I'm like, there it is. Yeah. <laughs> I uh, I had a uh, coworker that was from Buffalo and he might as well have been Canadian. Just constantly dropping car. It was great. And um, the, the purely Newfoundland thing is if you do this like inward, like, you suck in air when you say yes. You're like, yeah. <laughs> people say yes like that. So whenever <laughs> I talk to other people from Canada, if I do that, they're like, oh, you're from, you're from Newfoundland. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I am. <laughs> people tell me I have a West Virginia accent all the time and I, I don't hear it, but apparently, I mean, the United States obviously has a ton of different um, accents and whatnot. I think this is kind of funny. Garrick Reed says Jimmy constantly bashes wheel time yet has stated only positive things about it for the last four CWN. Interesting. Yeah, it's wild to think that you could not like something and also not be like just completely toxic about it. Isn't that a wild thing? Not be the mean Canadian about it. <laughs> yeah, geez, Sarah. I actually wasn't even meaning that towards you, but I, I'll just direct it at you because it's easy now. You hater. You absolute hater. To be fair, I hate Wheel of Time too, so we can get started on that one. <laughs> So, I, that's not true. I haven't read enough of Wheel of Time to hate it because I read 50 pages and said, I, I cannot possibly continue this. It hurts. Listen, for, for me, it's hard. It, you got you to come off the soapbox a little bit, Sarah. You had a Chinese romanticy as your <laughs> as your pick. OK, <laughs> let's relax. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not I'm not disparaging anybody else's taste. And I welcome you to to judge mine. I'm I'm aware. <laughs> I feel like you're open to the hatred. I think that I, that's am. The I am. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely reasonable. Um, Gavin also said this early. He said, I love bookish rivalries. So like who can recommend the best book? It's so fun. I take my recommendations way too serious, uh, which was why I was kind of like, I was almost dreading uh, when uh, fantasy awash and Joanna and I, mean, we're going to discuss the bone clocks because I was convinced that fantasy awash did not like the bone clocks. Cause she gave it three stars on this Instagram review. Turns out she accidentally gave it three stars. She meant to give it 4.25 and she put it on the wrong book because it was like multiple books. So I went into this conversation being like, oh, God, I'm going to have to defend this book. And like she didn't like it. And I recommend it. I was like stressed out about it. And then we had this conversation and she pulled out so many beautiful things to say about it. We had this great conversation. And I go, so why didn't you like the book then? And she's like, I did. I loved it. I'm like, you gave it three stars. So you probably thought it was just OK. She's like, no, I didn't. It was this big misconception. <laughs> But I I was like upset about it because I do I don't just yap my favorites of people no yes. matter what. Like when you go on R slash fantasy subreddit, you're like, I'm looking for like a quiet, cozy fantasy where like there's a strong entrepreneur and like the obvious answer is legends and lattes. And someone's like, Have you heard about Malazan? And you're like, <laughs> you, you did it again. You did it again. There's no right. reason to do that every single time. Every uh, recommendation is going to be The Name of the Wind, Mistborn, Stormlight yes. Archive. Like those are the books that end up on every post. Yeah. And and I don't want to ever be that. You know, I want to be someone that actually takes into consideration. In fact, the, the worst thing that you can do is if you're a random person on the street and be like, what book should I read? And I'm like, oh, God, please no. <laughs> I don't know. I don't want to be wrong because I always feel like someone who doesn't read, if I give them this book and they hate it, and it's their first fantasy, I might have ruined it for them. And that sucks. Yeah. It's a lot of pressure, for sure, especially when you take pride in your knowledge of books and your ability to recommend to people. It is it is a lot. But I, I think my first year on BookTube, 
and it wasn't even intentional. I just, because I was, as I said, I was coming back to fantasy after such a long time. And because I like to read popular things, I had a list of like all of the things that people love to read. And so that first year on booktube, I was reading all the things that everybody loved. Then I left for a little while and now I'm back. And I'm like, you know what? If you don't want to hear about my Chinese romance books, then you can just not watch this video, I guess. <laughs> that's, the, that's also the freeing part of your channel not being monetized, not having a Patreon. Like I don't have... I don't have anybody that I need to, not that I'm saying that anybody caters their content to that. No, but, get them, Sarah, get them. You know, if, if people have people who are following along with some expectation, I guess that they are putting funds towards, I'm like, you know, I could see how I personally would put pressure on myself to make sure that I'm putting out things that are of a certain standard and that, you know, will appeal to my audience. But no, I'm just like, you can be my weird friend and listen to my weird recommendations, I guess, if you want to. If you don't, that's fine. I came back and like the first like two weeks was just people unsubscribing. I was like, Andrew, people really don't like the Chinese fantasy novels, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but it was fine. Uh, Bookboard says, to be honest, even if you have a Patreon, I don't think you need to do what they want. They can stop supporting at any time. Totally, uh, I, totally. I'm fairly certain that 90% of my patrons don't like many of the things that I read and they just kind of like me, which is but somewhat then I need to be nice. Char as charming as you, which, you know, is not possible. I'm, I'm a mean Canadian. So, so I'm not I think gonna... it's the jawline mostly for me. Like, That's I don't think anyone's true. actually That's listening to what I say anymore. And they're just wondering, like, when am I going to say something stupid? Like one day, <laughs> you know, I'm going to cause a bunch of drama and it's going to be excellent. <laughs> Absolutely. But no, I don't think people... People don't have to do that. And I'm not saying that people do. I just know my personality. And it was a hard enough thing to get out of in the beginning, feeling like every video needed to be unique. Every video needed to be something that nobody else had ever talked about yeah. before. Like, yeah. you can't repeat the same books in two videos in a row. Like, you can't do, can't, can't, can't all of these things because that's just the way that I am with myself, not with anybody else. So I know that if people were supporting the channel, I would feel like I had to make a certain number of videos and I had to say, you know, not give an untrue opinion, but talk about the things that I know people would be interested in. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, like that now. yeah. I mean, I think that's fair. There's only so many things that are popular to talk about in the mm -hmm. fantasy genre, sci-fi genre anyways. So I think if you start out thinking that you're going to do this thing, like you're better off doing things that are going to interest you and inspire you long-term creatively because you will run out. Absolutely. That will happen. Yeah. Uh, and even, I mean, even like someone who has a great personality and has a unique approach, you know, if they're not covering the more popular stuff, like even then you're probably going to see less eyes. Mm -hmm. So you have to be okay with that. And you have to be comfortable with, you know, not always talking about the hottest thing, but if you do so happen to want to talk about the hottest thing, you should. You should do it. I used to try to limit my A Song of Ice and Fire talk because I was afraid I would burn people on it. But then I realized that it's so fundamental to like me as a reader that I would be not being transparent if I didn't relate a lot of the things back to A Song of Ice and Fire because it's the thing I know the best. So Yeah, absolutely. But there are other videos that I want to get back to. Like there are a few that I want to do that are from my early channel. Like I did a bunch when I first started of like, if you like this book, watch this anime, or if you like this anime, read this book. And I've watched a, a couple, like a few that I felt correlated really strongly with certain books. And I'm like, those videos did terrible. Can't wait to do another one. It's going to be great because like the people who do watch them, they're like, yes, these are like, you know, the 20 people that really like it. And there's something satisfying about that too. Like sometimes when I, when you put out, you know, one of the really popular types of video, like a TBR or whatever, and a bunch of people watch it, you're like, yeah, they're watching it. It's like going along in the background, but then you put out these really niche videos and you've got this small group of people and you know that they're watching it all the way through. Like, I feel like the, the videos that I do that don't get as many views, the time that people spend watching them is always longer in the, whatever the metrics or whatever you call them. Yeah. And that's, that's also something to appreciate. It's good. I, like you said, this is a hobby. I don't, it doesn't matter if they get lost in the algorithm. It's just, you know, am I going to find a, you know, some strange little people like me to watch these, these videos? Yeah. I think I, I one of my favorite things I've ever done is actually the Farseer video where I talk about a moment that's very easily missable. Now I did get a bunch of comments on the video being like, if you miss this, you're dumb. I'm like, <laughs> 
which is gonna what? which is gonna come anyway <sighs> whatever dude he's a reddit mod you know it like there's no way he's not um i'm hating well, on reddit a lot funny after this story but you go ahead <laughs> but but i like whenever i make videos that can be useful to people uh i i've only done a few of those uh and honestly the ones that i've done aren't great quality like they're not something that's as, as elaborate as honestly like jared or uh library ladder for instance you know their videos are just absolutely terrifically put together and the presentation is outstanding mine aren't that but even just the baseline of helping someone maybe reappreciate a book to me is like the best feeling in the world i a lot of people have been like you know it's probably good it's probably a good idea to stop doing like things everyone else does like monthly tbrs and stuff like this or wrap-ups my dirty secret is i love doing wrap-ups i love the monthly wrap-up it's for me it, it, it's for me i love doing the patreon pick and i'll continue to do it because there's something about trying to concisely relay my experience with a book and a wrap up that I find to be very challenging and fun, uh, depending on how I approach it. But you know what I'm going to be doing? I think I, I ordered, uh, a wireless mic for it. I think I am going to start my girly book vlog era. I think, nice. I'm, I think I'm doing it. I'm saying the Dresden vlogs that I made were the, the most fun videos that I made on booktube. They were so fun. Yeah. I, I, I wise man's fear vlog video. No, not no one really watched it because it's a book too. And it's full spoilers. Why would they? It's one of the most fun times I've ever had. And I've been doing one piece over on dudes talking manga in a vlog format. Mm -hmm. uh, now this is actually going to be a little bit more vloggy. Like I'm probably going to be talking to dudes at my jujitsu gym in the videos about nice. their favorite books. like just little things like that. I'm also probably just going to do like really bad baking. Like I want it to be purposely terrible baking and then give people the recipe. Like I just think it'll be hilarious of me. Um, maybe I'll go get my first manicure. I don't know. Uh, no, I, I kind of want to just do that because there's so many books I start randomly. Like I'll just read chapter one of a book with no intention of continuing. Mm -hmm. And then I never get to talk about it. If I do a vlog, it's a little more in the moment. I think that is nice. Fun. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Jimmy talks to seven BGG guys who all love Marcus Aurelius. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> and I kid you not, the author I've seen discussed more in any jiu-jitsu locker room. I've been a part of three different gyms. And we're talking well above 20 people, Brandon Sanderson. People love Brandon Sanderson. And the other one, Evan Winter. Rage of Dragons. I did not read Rage of Dragons. It's it has a training montage and it's very like that makes better. sense. It, it's a shonen type thing. Yeah. And I think that shonen now, all of them like anime and manga. All right. of them. I wore a berserk uh, rash guard two weeks ago, and I was a superstar. People were like, dude, you were the most popular, yeah. most popular boy at the gym. Yeah, they're like, <laughs> bro, the Eclipse. I'm like, I know, dude. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> like, we're talking about nerd stuff while we're strangling each other, which which is funny. So uh, I am going to try to do uh, a reading vlog and see how it goes. Also, Gavin, you're 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 the best at vlogs. I don't know if if, if you guys like reading vlogs and you haven't watched Gavin's reading vlogs, they're literally the goat. It's best. I love reading blogs. I just find it soothing. And I'm like, people have such interesting lives. I could not make a vlog where I cooked or baked anything because I feel like I do nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Andrew. He does all of the household stuff. He is the stay-at-home person. Like he does the cleaning and the cooking and the baking. And you know, he makes the cookies for the bake sales and all that kind of stuff. So I'd be like, here's my job that I work too many hours at. And then I come home and, you know, we play some board games and go to bed. Yeah, I Honestly, I wish I played more board games uh, and I don't know how I'll ever have time. To, I have so many board games <laughs> like I bought Gloomhaven. I've never played it. I always pretend like I have friends in real life. And I realize that I, I, I in fact, like I don't, friends. which it happens to be a non-starter for board games. Uh, my parents live in an in-law suite in our house and they like board games, too. So we play with them all the time. Not that that makes me any cooler because that, you know, I'm admitting that I hang out with my parents more than any other friends. But it uh, they love board games. We love them. So we play a lot. Yeah. The last time I played a board game was a cheater version of Monopoly at Christmas, I think, with uh, my wife's family. And then people started cheating because you're allowed to. And then everyone got mad that people were cheating, even though it was the cheaters edition of Monopoly. And then we quit. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, you know, maybe next year we don't pick Monopoly. That Alan be can't be year. here right now if he just heard that the last game you played was Monopoly. And he's not saying, OK, here we go. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> but yes, we would. I was talking before you showed up, Alan. I was talking about when you and Andrew teamed up to destroy me in the board games that we played. <laughs> 
I, I also thought it was ironic or not even ironic, but just kind of hilarious. Yeah. No one likes monopoly. Not, not a single person um, that Alan drove to meet you and then played board games with you. Like that's just such an Alan thing to do. It was so fun. We had the best time. Awesome. It was, it was so good. Yeah. I don't know what's going to, what's going to happen next time we go back because he's going to have a little baby, but hopefully we'll find a way to meet up somewhere. I'm hoping I get to see Alan next month. That would be great if we can make time for it. Um, but Alan has a kid on the way. <laughs> he might, that kid might be born that week. Who knows? Um, Gavin says, even if you don't do much vlogs, just feel like catching up with a friend. So say and do whatever. It's the best time. I also think because I haven't been doing reviews uh, on the channel and I do chatting with nuts mostly every other week, unless if stuff comes up, I got something come up last week. So I couldn't, uh, you know, and then I have the monthly. So I'm putting out roughly like, three videos a month, maybe four if I, I make something else. So I think vlogs, if I did them bi-weekly or every three weeks, even there could be that, that. That's just another thing that people could look forward to. And it's a different type of content. And it's not going to be like this, right? Where it's three hours long. That's not my goal. It, it's it's yeah. not to do that. But it still plays to the strength of me being conversational, which is something that I enjoy. That's how I like to approach videos a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. So I just think it, it plays to my strengths. It's something different. I've never tried it before, so it's a bit challenging. And I do have some unique ideas that maybe can make it stand out against other reading vlogs. But honestly, I love reading reading vlog or watching reading vlogs. I Me watch too. reading vlogs of people that I don't like the books they read. <laughs> right. It's just nice. Like I said, it's soothing. It's nice to see what they're they're doing. It does it does seem conversational, like you said. Yeah, absolutely. And Alan said I, I talked about that tonight with Christina Jimmy. Good. Well, make sure the baby doesn't come. I'd, I'd be very, <laughs> very appreciative of that. Uh, we did have someone uh, way back ago. Diego, I apologize. But Diego asked, reading Mystic River now, my first Dennis Lehane, do you guys like him? I've only ever heard of him. I've never actually read any of his books. Have you, Sarah? Did he write Shutter Island? I'm going to say yes, without zero reason to say that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quickly look it up as I ask this question. Um, if he did, then I have, because I have read Shutter Island. But I don't remember. Is Shutter Island a great book? Him. I'm gonna I'm gonna be honest, guys. I didn't know Shutter Island was a book until just now. Shutter Island book. Yes, it is by him. Um, I don't remember because I read it and watched it at the same time. So I read it, watched the movie, and I have a very very low tolerance for fear. And it's not even a scary movie. It's a psychological thriller. I read slash watched it a summer when I went home from university and my parents' house is only three bedrooms. So I didn't have a room there anymore. And that was great because I had to sleep with my sister for like the first month because I was scared after watching this movie. <laughs> like it did something to my brain. I am such a baby, such a baby. But I do remember that it clearly it had some sort of impact. It was vivid enough because it frightened the crap out of me. It's just interesting to me, like you've been just spewing hatred all night to all these people and, and telling them how stupid they are for liking like Brandon <laughs> Sanderson. And then you're giving them ammo like they know you hate whales. <laughs> now they know you're scared. I mean, what are, you're sabotaging yourself. Scared. I know. I know. Why? Well, the first time I was on chatting with nuts, I already told you about how my daughter psychologically t tortured me with whale paraphernalia, which is how <laughs> I overcame some of my fear of whales. I am going to try to read Moby Dick this year. I said it last year, but I mean it this time. <laughs> really good. Excellent. You can send me updates. Let me know how much you love that. He's still that chasing whale. this thing. It's crazy. It has hip bones for no reason. This is wild. <laughs> Why? Why? Uh, speaking of his child, Alan says, fingers crossed. He comes while I'm visiting Jimmy. Oh, no. I missed the gross part of human birth. Whatever will I do? <laughs> that is a wild thing to say in public. No, Christina needs you to be there. <laughs> you know what's great about uh, getting back? I'm, I'm bouncing all over the place, but getting back to Shutter Island is one, I didn't know it was a book. And two, it's been so long since I've seen the movie. I don't remember. I know there's a twist. I don't remember the twist, which is perfect. I might read that. That, that could be fun because I remember loving the movie. I was also not a psychiatrist when I watched it. So I wonder if I watched it now, how I would feel about it. Like what, how would I feel? about the movie in general yeah i wonder i i mean the only thing i can really remember about it is there being some sort of like like brick keep or something like that's literally all i can really remember and i remember the twist getting me like whenever mm -hmm. i was younger 
So I should, it'd be a brand new experience. And then Mystic River was also a movie, I believe. So I didn't ever watch it. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's one of those DVDs I got from Netflix. And then I just sent it back. But uh, yeah, I need to read some of that. We have a question from Third Space Maker that I'm going to I'm going to delegate to you. Uh, it says best romance books for people who don't read romance regularly. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I'm the best person to ask this question to either. <laughs> I if you, I mean, if you're a fantasy reader, then presumably you would want to read a fantasy book that has some romance in it. I really liked The Binding last year. That was one that was yeah that was really that sounded good i actually thought that good. sounded interesting i like that evie is right persuasion is really good if you like classics but i mean it is it is jane austen and i really like that evie really likes that but if you're you know you have to know what you're going into i think persuasion has one of the best romantic confessions that i have ever read it is excellent clive barker i hope that's a romance recommendation that is that's a <laughs> wild recommendation <laughs> Oh, that's amazing. Emily Henry, people tend to really like because her writing is really good. Um, a lot of people really like, um, help me with the date, Jimmy, 11, 22, 63. Is that oh, the, man. Well, yeah. Yeah, I love that. That book. has a great romance. Like if you are trying to read something that is more romance oriented, but you read a lot of sci-fi fantasy, then I think that's a, that's a pretty good one to go for too. It's a good transition book because it does focus a lot on the romance. Yeah. This is KB recommends it says the best romance series of all time is Kushiel's Dark by Jacqueline Carey. If you're into fantasy, like a sexy Game of Thrones, but even sexier than that. Uh, this is one that has been on the TBR forever. And when when I did the last episode, I when that was a solo episode. I was kind of talking about books I really wanted to get in at least attempt this year, which honestly, looking back on that list and the mood I've been in, like I want to read everything I didn't mention because I'm an idiot. But <laughs> Kushiel's Dark was actually supposed to be on that list. I've heard that the writing is absolutely gorgeous. Nice. Uh, I have this book. So if you read it, you should tell me so we can talk about it. Now, I've heard there's a lot of sex in it, just so you know. Like, I don't know if you're adverse who to that, read, but I have guess the romance here. <laughs> well, I'm just, I'm just saying I heard it has like media. I heard it's crazy. But, it, yeah, it is. I, ha I do know what it's about. I have had a copy for a long time. Like I've had the first book. I don't have any of the others in the in the series, but I have owned the first one in the middle of a buddy. <laughs> in the, mi the middle of a buddy. Yeah. <laughs> Alan believes that the, my reflection on this book is my reflection on the time I've had reading it with him. This is actually the most successful buddy read me and Alan have ever had. We've been reading it almost at the exact same pace because I've been reading other stuff as I'm reading it. Uh, Alan, you will be happy to hear this. And, and I don't know if you've read these, uh, Sarah, but my discord has exploded and has been reading Great Coats by Sebastian Day Castell. I have read them. I really like Great Coats. Really People like are like. People are loving it. And I know he just released or did release a new book in that series or like tied into that series, which is kind of cool. Mm -hmm. So that's one that's definitely moved up and it's free on Audible in the United States, which is cool. Nice. I really like Great Coats. You know what? This is actually, this will tell me how long it's been that we've been trying to do Chatting with Nuts because we were talking about having a conversation back in October when I read Tokyo Ghoul, which is oh, the I was manga that it. I loved last year. And I thought it was so good. Uh, I was hoping you wouldn't bring up Tokyo Oh, no, Gold. you read it and you didn't like it? No, I just still haven't got past chapter one. I kept telling <gasps> you I'm going to read it. You and my friend Bees love this, love this series. And I read chapter one of Tokyo Ghoul. I thought it was great. And I just haven't finished it. So I got to finish uh, Marine Ford in One Piece. And then it's yep. a, there's like a good break, like right after. There's like a little arc and there's a break. During that break, I'm going to take a break from One Piece and read some other stuff because I want to read uh, like Jujutsu Kaisen and then Tokyo Ghoul's number one. So I just feel bad because I've been telling you for so no, long. No. If you if you had read it and then hated it, I would be sad. I would not be mad, but I would be sad. But the fact that you haven't read it, I we just talked about the fact that I've been reading Ship of Destiny for two years. Like I'm in no place to judge. I yeah, have you're no right. high ground. Yeah. Yeah. Forget you. 20th Century Boys is going well. I just read volume seven. So I have eight through 11 left to go. Hi. Also very good. I it's read the first bind up and loved it and haven't got back to it since because yeah. one piece grabbed me. And it's very different than monster, but it's also excellent. I don't know which one I like more to be honest, because they're so completely different and they're both really well done. 
but Tokyo Ghoul, I was not expecting to love. So Tokyo Ghoul was the thing that Andrew wanted me to read last year. So mm -hmm. I was like, okay, I will, I will finally read it because he loves it. And I read it and it was so good. I was not expecting to read the entire thing in October, but it was, it was so good. Yeah, I uh, I'm excited to get to it. Like, I, it has an aesthetic that I, I very much like. Uh, it's like you know horror adjacent, so I'm I'm a pretty big fan of that. David wants to know, Sarah, did you and your husband drink beer and watch Lord of the Rings on for Valentine's Day? Is this a ritual? What is so this? we do usually do something like that because we're not very into. And so my daughter is old enough now that she is interested in Valentine's Day and like very like ooh like romance, and she is very very girly like very and I use that like loosely because I you know don't subscribe to gender norms etc cetera, etc cetera, whatever but like she is very like we are very opposite people and it's interesting because it's just fun to watch her grow up and like the things that she likes and also be in the background being like is this how my mom felt when I was into dragons and she wanted me to read like all of these like <laughs> she wanted me to be into the outfits and the hair and all this stuff and now Juliet is very much into that so she was very much like when Valentine's Day came and she was like, so mom, what, what romantic thing did dad do? And I was like, we don't, we don't really do romantic things on Valentine's. She was like, what, why you're married? That's the benefit of being married. And I was like, well, you know, there's, there's probably some other benefits. Being Tax married. breaks. <laughs> right? So we did not watch Lord of the Rings this year. We, we played Overcooked together. So we, um, we, you know, we always do something like fun and nerdy but uh, not not romantic, much to Juliet's eternal disappointment. I mean, Lord of the Rings watch along can be romantic. Go into the Very Shire, true. you know, Very just true. something breathtaking about that opening scene still mm -hmm. to this day. Um, you're, you're not alone. I, I, I We don't really do anything for Valentine's Day. We get a pizza. We're like, yeah, That's exactly. It. We meant to play something different. So we tried to play this game. I don't remember. I don't know if Andrew's out there. Or I would ask him what the name of it is. But there's this video game that came out that is about a husband and a wife. Like the game is a husband and a wife and you play as the husband and a wife. And we were going to play that because Andrew thought he bought it on sale, like during the like Christmas steam sale or whatever sale, whatever it was. And we went to like bring it up and apparently he had just like downloaded a promo or something. He was like, I don't actually have this game. Yes, it takes two. That's what it was. Hmm. I was like, well, isn't this just a perfect, you know, metaphor for marriage? <laughs> we really thought we were doing this, but it's not happening. We're just going to roll with it. I uh, I did have a great time. I was playing a uh, side scrolling dark fantasy RPG called The Last Faith last night. And Kelsey was sitting next to me and she was reading the like walkthrough guide on Google to me as I was playing. So like I didn't have to like bounce around and it it was awesome. That was like one of my favorite memories we've had in recent times because it reminded me back. You remember when you ever used to play video games in the same room with people? Like, it's like, yes. oh, I miss this. And she loves like being helpful and on Google. Like in Dark Souls, I'm constantly like, Kelsey, do I give this guy this uh this soul or do I not? Is it gonna kill me if I give it to him? And she's like, let me look. And she's like, which one are you playing? And she's fantastic. She is my strategy guide. Nice. Um, yeah, she is. She is pretty uh, incredible. Uh, Bell to asked this question said, have either of you read Jenny Wirtz been chatting with her quite a bit lately and starting in April. So I have read, uh, the first book and a half of Wars of light and shadow. And I did not continue, uh, quite infamously, uh, I'm no longer part of that read along. Unfortunately, uh, Sarah, have you, I have not, I know that you and Joanna and everybody who were, you know, involved in that read along seem to like her work. And apparently the writing is really good, but I, I have not. You're like, no, I'm just gonna. <laughs> Wait, what? I don't know. Your face just looks like you're like, no, I, I have things in my mind that are not. Oh, no. No, so. StreamYard, for some reason, starred like 50 comments. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> how am I going to sort through these? No, no, you're good. Continue. Okay, excellent. No, but people are just giving some game recommendations, which is good because Andrew's always trying to get me to play some with him. I'm not great at video games. I do like watching him play and like modern video games have such good stories and cutscenes. like watching the newest final fantasy one was like going to a movie i wouldn't even let him play it unless i was in the room i was like i need to know what happens i'm invested i need to but there are you know there's some good ones apparently for couples to play together as well he'll be happy if i bring back some of these recommendations to him 
um someone also was mentioning uh heir to the empire uh, yeah the empire trilogy uh the collaborative effort between feist and warts is something that i still play it on uh reading and then to ride hell's chasm i have that as well uh, i think that one's i think i got that one signed at ICFA. i think i can't really remember nice. at this point it feels like it's been forever uh long ago but empire trilogy is definitely the one of the ones that i would like to uh to get to, to uh get to. and we do have some fantasy news that's exciting i was trying to think of something not fancy news because like that's you know daniel green saying i don't want to get sued uh adam k says probably going to get some uh new scott lynch stuff next year too and this has been exciting so broken binding has announced that they're going to be releasing the first three books of uh lies of the gentleman bastards uh which it, it just always annoys me because i don't have a subscription to uh broken binding i've been on the wait list for a couple months now and people are saying that like there's like Apparently, a 10 year wait decades ten... long. I got this. You got the same email. I'm assuming as me where it's like, we have to close one of our wait lists because it has a more than 10 year. I was like, yeah, that's this, ridiculous. I'm never ending up on this, on this, yeah. <laughs> like, on this service. And I'm just like, I would like to give you my money. So I, that's a whole other co conversation. Uh, but that was only of one of the cool announcements that mm -hmm. Scott Lynch has kind of been teasing. He got new author pictures done and he said, I didn't get them done just for fun and on a whim. Nice. And it seems like he has really been able to handle a lot of the issues that were kind of plaguing him and he's gotten help and he's been on medicine. That's really helping for him. Uh, if, if any of you guys are curious, Murphy put out a video that was really good about this. And, you know, she's saying, you know, we shouldn't get too excited, but I'm also too excited because <laughs> she loves the series so much. Uh, and as someone who has finally got caught up in gentlemen bastards and do love Scott Lynch, I'm very excited to see what he has. I know there was talks about some novellas coming out, uh, but Hey, maybe, Maybe book four would come out. That would be fantastic. That'd be nice. And they are doing a 10 year anniversary of the, uh, of the first one, right? The, they are. Yeah. They're doing a, a special edition 10 year anniversary book. I think. Wait, is this the Golance one that's only in the UK? Maybe. I'm not sure. I just know someone like posted it in discord and they were like a 10 year anniversary book. Maybe that means the fourth one's finally coming. And I was like, yeah, tell that to my copy of name of the winds 10 year anniversary. <laughs> Yeah, you know what was weird about the name of the win one is that Wise Man's Fear came and went and we didn't get a 10-year anniversary for it because Nothing. I like the yeah, I like the name of the win 10 year anniversary Me too. edition. I, I really do like it. Yeah, I saw the broken binding. I think it was broken binding that just did the name of the win, right? Or somebody did, and it was like a couple hundred bucks. And I was like, you know what? I'm good. I was like, I, yeah. I like the one I bought from Books like a Million. Yeah. Kyle was really nice, actually. He got a um, a copy of the Sword of Kaigen one from, I don't remember which Kickstarter it was, one of the special editions of Sword of Kaigen that's really nice. And his came with a flaw and they like resent books out for books that were damaged. And he messaged me and was like, you know, it's it's damaged, but it's not that damaged. Like if you would like to have it, I'll send it to you. And I was like, that's so nice of you. So I ended up with a copy, which was awesome and nice. really pretty. Yeah, that's excellent. I, you know, the one thing about these specialty print subs, for the most part that I've heard, you know, they cost a lot of money, but they will take care of it if there's something messed up. Because I know, uh, I think it was Jake Bishop, he got his Way of Kings Leatherbound, and like, I think half the book was upside down or something. And he's freaking out. He's like, oh my God, you know, this thing took a year to get, but they replaced it for him, which is nice. actually pretty cool. So that is, I mean, yeah. that's one nice thing. Uh, awesome. Adam followed it up and said, Subpress did mention they got verbal confirmation of a long awaited trio of books that will be coming out next year. May or not, may not be Lynch novellas. Who can say? Well, that's very exciting. Scott Lynch to me is a very talented guy. And uh, anyone that has been able to kind of get out of the rut mentally with whatever they're struggling with, whether or not even if you like his books, I think that's still fantastic news that someone's doing what they love to do. Absolutely. As someone who has definitely had times where like my mental health, you know, kind of discontinued me doing things that I love to do. And I don't, I, you know, I didn't want it to happen, but it just did, you know, just someone to kind of overcome that I think is a feel good story for mostly anybody. So absolutely. Yeah. And it's, and it's tough. People are struggling now more than ever. It seems like, so it's, it is nice when you see people get out of that. Yeah, absolutely. And <laughs> Feltube says, Alan, when are you getting new author photos? And Alan said, I look terrible in photos because autism, which I, you're going to have to clarify this next time you're on. Cause I don't, I don't know if that's how that works, Alan. I don't, I don't think that's how it works. <laughs> Alan says things that are so wild, but like still endearing somehow. Cause it's Alan. <laughs> that is Alan. That's, <laughs> that's everything. Absolutely. And I don't remember Jimmy. Cause I, we were talking about my favorite book of the year. So my, 
traditional fantasy favorite book of the year was um the Gideon the Ninth books, like the the Lock Doom books. This was on my those? list. No, this is on my list to talk to you about because okay. you picked the Chinese romance fantasy that no one ever heard of. Yep. And then to follow it up, you were talking about uh Nona the Ninth and Gideon or mm -hmm. right, Nona is it Nona the Ninth? Nona, yeah. Nona and Gideon. And I have heard almost unanimously everyone hating this book. Oh, so people I need, despise them. I yeah, what is going on here? See, this is this is what I think. This is why I can say that I don't like Brandon Sanderson is because I also am fine if people don't like the things that I like because I understand that it's you know it's a a personal taste. I loved the Lock Tomb, and for me, you haven't read them, right? I don't know anything uh, except doesn't it use like common like slang like lit AF? Yes. Or yes. So yeah. why I so I loved the Lock Tomb for lots of reasons. But one thing that I loved about it is that, I'm sorry, Alan, it, to me, it feels like, it feels like the Dark Tower. It is not, I am not saying that everybody who likes the Dark Tower is going to like the Dark Tomb or is going to like the Lock Tomb because there's going to be a big chunk of people who like the Dark Tower who are going to hate certain things about the Lock Tomb and they're not going to be able to get over it. But the things that I love about Lock Tomb are the things that I love about the Dark Tower. They are the same. And it would really surprise me if the person who wrote the Lock Tomb had not at least read the Dark Tower because there's so many things that feel similar to me. So in it's what, in what it's manner? Not, because that's a weird like Dark Tower is not one thing. Uh, it is like, not one thing. And so so this is one thing. And I if there's one thing that I'm confident about, it is my Dark Tower love. So I'm I'm good to haul that out anytime. Oh, so yeah, number one. The Lock Tomb series is a weird amalgamation of things. Like it is sci-fi, it is fantasy, it is post-apocalyptic, it is right. Nobody ever talks about that part, but it is apocalyptic. You have, to, you you have you to make it through. You have to make it past Gideon the Ninth to um, to even know that the series is post-apocalyptic, but it is, and it's got this weird like mix of popular culture and also sounding like an old-time fantasy and also having like all of the sci-fi terms. And it so it has that mixture because, you know, it it might not feel like the gunslinger or um Wizard and Glass, but it certainly feels like Wolves of the Kala and Song of Susanna. It has that really weird blending of like pop culture, modern culture. I know, and those are the books that everybody I was say you just mentioned <laughs> this. when you said Song of Susanna, like five people just turned the stream off. They said oh, Absolutely, my God. which is which is fine. i this is <laughs> what I'm doing actually is making sure the least amount of people possible watch this episode of chatting with the nuts. <laughs> I'm sorry. Sorry for your ratings. This is why it takes a year and a half for me to get back on the show. I don't make it twice a year because everybody <laughs> likes. But... Alan said he vomited in his chair. Um, but so all of those things, I and I personally, so I think one big thing that turns people off of Lock Tomb immediately is that you get introduced to Gideon, who's the main character. And even I, like in the first couple chapters, I was like, oh, this is going to be like one of those edgy characters. And I watched, I think I saw Matt from Matt's fantasy book reviews here at some point, but I watched his review of it. And this was one of the things that he said was like, I just couldn't get past it. Like I couldn't get past the edginess of Gideon. And what I thought as I made it through the, the book and I made it to the end is that, so Gideon is a very purposefully abrasive character in the beginning with like, you know, she's got the clever turns of phrase and she's sarcastic and she's, you know, she's pushing back at, at you know, at where she's, where she's from and kind of pissing everybody off around her. But she also has this really like sweet and protective side, which you don't see a lot like in the edgy characters. It's usually like, OK, I'm going to break through this facade and I'm going to bring them out and they're going to realize yeah. that they're actually a good person. But Gideon's a good person. She's just also a shit. Like she just likes to antagonize people on purpose. And so I feel like it, it separated itself from, you know, the like the truly edgy characters, at least for me. And I do genuinely think that Tamsin Muir is clever. Like I think that the writing is funny. I think that the humor is funny. I think that it's I think it does a really good job. But I do think that to appreciate everything that she's doing with the series, you have to make it past Gideon. And because Gideon is so polarizing, it's really difficult for people to appreciate the scope of the entire series. And I totally understand that because it is it has a tone and a voice 
that is going to turn so many people off in the beginning, yeah. which is fine. And you might not end up liking the rest of the series, but the three books are so different from one another. Book two is like, in terms of the way that the story is delivered is one of the most unique books that I have ever read. It has an incredibly weird setup and execution. It has this, again, with the second person, like whenever someone writes in second person, I'm like, oh, this is so good. This is so weird, but also, and so unnatural, but so enjoyable. And then the third book is totally different tonally. It feels like a Stephen King kind of slice of life. It It is the last thing that you were expecting. So every time I read one of these books, I got nothing that I was expecting. Like I went into Gideon expecting, because the tagline that everybody gives you is lesbian necromancers in space, which was already a sell for me. I was like, this is fine. Like, this is going to be great. It's going to be a good time. I'm, I'm here. Sounds like a it. Peter Watts book. <laughs> right. Yeah. But then it was so like, it is actually what it is, is like a closed house murder mystery. Like they're locked in a, in a place and they need to solve a mystery. Like people are dying and nobody knows why, but there's only them. So, you know, they need to figure out what's happening. So you don't, really even know what the first book's about because nobody actually says what it's about. They just call it lesbian necromancers in space, which is really has nothing to do with anything that the book is about. Yeah. Then this I went like in, Dark Tower kind of. Right. Then I went into the second one and I was like, okay, well now I know what to expect because I read Gideon. And then I started heroin. I was like, what the fuck is this? Like, I have no idea what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> and then when I read Hera, I was like, okay, got to prepare for the weirdest shit imaginable. And then I pick up Nona. I'm like, this is a slice of life. Like, this feels like the, I don't know, the school episode of, a, of an anime. Like, I had no idea. So each book, like, slapped me in the face with how little I was expecting it. And it won me over. I'm, I'm a fan. If the fourth book lands, it is going to be probably a top three series for me. Listen. I'm not, I'm not kidding. So there are only four planned? Yes. I have never been interested in reading the series until, until you spoke until you spoke. And honestly, this was the, the number one question I wanted to ask you about, because when I saw that on your list, everything I'd heard about it is that, you know, you know, slang is, is modern. It's terrible. It's edgy. And you, you can sell me. <laughs> Alan is losing his mind. <laughs> give me, give me. <laughs> I can hear it. I can literally. Alan would be, to be fair. <laughs> um, Alan will definitely. I mean, Alan hates most of the books that I like, by the way. Um, middle of a buddy of a buddy. Read. <laughs> and it's so fun. Like, I find it so funny. And it, it was so unexpectedly funny. Like, it's not just the edgy humor. Like, there's this weird. The magic is really cool. Like, you know, not a lot of people write about necromancy. Like, speaking of, you know, the Tyranny of Faith series. Like, yeah, that is say, a, Richard right? Swan does it and does it very exactly. well, in my opinion. I actually right? love all the necromancy stuff is sick. Exactly, because we don't get to see it much. Like, it is a magic. It is a type of magic that we don't get to see used very often. And mm -hmm. it's just, and like I said, I think a lot of people read Gideon. They're like, no, this is not for me. This is so confusing. And you will still be confused, but it is It is actually really intricately plotted. I think it's funny. I think it. she definitely pushes, or I, I don't remember if it, if Tamsin Muir goes by she or they, but regardless, the Tamsin Muir pushes a lot of, boundaries with the with the book i think that it's definitely worth it and even i think if you read it and you were like sarah gideon the ninth was terrible like i i did not have a good time i would still be like please just read the second one just so we can at least see how you feel about yeah the expansion of the of the world yeah i mean at the uh, something doing something different is awesome uh, i love murder mystery i love post-apocalyptic stuff uh, and I love necromancy. So there is some stuff there that's interesting to me. I don't know how I'll feel about the edginess slash modern slang that that could bounce off, but I will try it. Uh, yeah. I don't know when, but I will try it. Uh, also, I really like those covers quite a bit. They're so cool. Yeah. Every They're, time I see yeah. them, I'm like, those, those are, those are pretty tight. Yeah. Um, I mentioned Peter Watts and KB says, or asks, has anyone read Blindside by Peter Watts? Uh, I don't really know what to think about. I have. And I think it's a really awesome book. And I think that, Peter Watts is going like as far out of left field with vampires in space that you ever possibly could. Uh, again, you know, people say blindside is vampires in space, but it's so much more than that. And about mm -hmm. human consciousness and whether or not like free will exist, it is mind boggling to be honest with you. Uh, but I'm, I'm a big Peter Watts fan. I just picked up his debut, um, which is like a deep sea sci-fi horror type thing, I guess. And I think the deep sea is very fascinating. So I'm excited to try that out. It's his debut. So I don't know if it's going to be as polished as 
uh, Blindside was. But um, to, to, to a author, obviously, that is doing something crazy to an author that has been around a long time and that we both love. And I just fell in love with her through one story this past year. And she cleaned up in my year into words. And that was Octavia Butler. And you mentioned that you wanted to read more Octavia Butler. Have you read Parable for the of the Sower? I've only yet? read the first one, Parable of the Sower. So, and this is the reason I have not read Parable of the Talents is because I have a special edition. I've complained about this so many times. So if you've watched my channel, you've probably heard this story. But I bought a special edition or like an anniversary edition, some sort of edition of Parable of the Sower. And it had a foreword by N.K. Jemison. And I was like, I won't read this until I get to the end of the book, because sometimes there's spoilers in these because they're classic novels. Right. So people expect yep. that you've read them and you're like, yep. OK, so I read Parable of the Sower. It gutted me. Her books are so, so dark and so emotional. Yep. And I went back to the beginning. I was like, OK, great. I'm going to read this introduction. And the introduction spoils Parable of the Talents. Yeah, see, I don't I stop reading forwards for the most part, unless if I'm not super in, like if I'm not like caring that much about the plot i'll read mm -hmm. it or i'll read it after but you gotta be careful with them forwards Man. right i thought it was safe i was like i'm doing the right thing this is great it spoiled the other book and i was like ah oh, this is so frustrating but i've heard the I, second am, book I am still better. gonna read it it's just that it uh i then i it took away my desire to read it immediately because i was like maybe i'll yeah. forget but then every time i look at it i remember the exact spoiler because i'm like i'm so mad at you book it's never gonna leave now i um I'm going to read Parable of the Sower this year and I'm, nice. I'm really, really excited. And I just, I'm a little nervous because I think Kendrid is like an all timer. So, I, so I, I just hope that Parable of the Sower is, you know, at least 80% as good. If it is, it's going to be one of the best books of the year. Uh, and also thank God she writes shorter books. Yes. <laughs> she, she doesn't write those chunkers. But, the, but so impactful, you do, a short book. And so what I love, what I loved about Kindred and what was interesting and what I think a lesser author could not have pulled off. Like it takes someone like Octavia E. Butler to pull this off is that she writes this character who goes into this terrible situation. And the main character has so much empathy for everybody around her. And mm -hmm. it is an unexpected part of that kind of story. It's not something that you see often. Right. And it's hard to, and it's hard to pull off well because they are in such a terrible situation and there are so many awful things that are happening, but it really showed the complexity of the relationship. I don't remember the young guy's name now, the, the young boy who lived in the the home that she kept get pulling, she kept getting Rufus. pulled into Rufus, but that relationship was was done so well, and you could feel your disgust, but also you could feel the struggle that yes. she was having, and it was it was so well done. It was and it was so hard to read, but it was excellent. yeah. So taking uh, you know, I don't even want to call it the easy out, but the easier thing to do would to be like just to seek vengeance or, or whatever she actually takes the harder path and that's being a good person absolutely and uh i that's kind of what i got commented on constantly about kindred is that this is a book that could have been very this is this it's awful yeah. experience that we hate these people yeah. uh but octavia butler was a much bigger thinker than that and i mean what it like having to face a situation in kindred with slavery someone that is from the modern day getting sent back it's just like it's almost like really facing that part of history. Absolutely. And, and not just in the like, this is obviously a bad way, but like really facing it with mm -hmm. today's knowledge. And uh, it was tremendous. Like what a, what a beautiful book, uh, but also horribly dark. Um, so I'm excited to read more Octavia Butler. I saw she was on your list of people you want to read more of, and I'm with you 100%. I would like to read most of what she's uh, put out there. Yeah. Parable yeah. of the Sower, I, I really enjoyed, but it was it was even darker. I thought that uh, it was in a different way. Like there, this is what gets me is there is a throwaway line and this is not a spoiler in any way, because it's literally just like a one sentence throwaway line, but because Octavia E. Butler is Octavia E. Butler, even a throwaway line can have such a punch. And there was a throwaway line about violence towards children. And it just like, that is the one thing that I find so hard in any book that I read. And then when I read it, I was like, Ugh. like it's so sad. Even the part, like the part in, um, the stand where you get like the little vignettes from Stephen King. And there's one about the kid who is like on yeah. his own. I'm like, Oh, I can't handle this. Like this is yeah. so sad. This, it, it just hurts me. And it, uh, but yeah, Parable of the Sower was excellent. 
Yeah, I'm super excited to read it. Uh, I, I like the fact that apparently you don't have to read book two immediately, which obviously you haven't. But like, I guess that they're kind of separate. I've heard a lot of people say book two does what book one does, but does it better, which is nice. kind of fascinating. I've also heard that about uh, the Sparrow by somebody. I can't remember her name, Mary Kate Russell or something like that. But I've heard the uh, Sparrow is a very dark sci fi as well. But I guess the sequel really flushes more things out about it. So that's another uh, older sci-fi that I'm, I'm hoping to get to this year. David Sloan asked, Jimmy, have you read Macbeth as an adult? If not, please read it. It is overtly the inspiration for Stannis and Melisandre plotline. I know Gurm is a massive fan of Shakespeare. I have not read Macbeth since high school, but I remember reading it and absolutely loving it. I also love Julius Caesar. I feel One like Macbeth is an easy favorite for fantasy lovers. Like that's the Shakespeare play that we all like because <laughs> the witches are there and mary doria russell thank you folks i appreciate it yeah i've heard it's uh i've heard it's pretty brutal uh but we'll see uh i was supposed to hopefully get to that this month or next month but i don't think it's going to work with uh the reads that i have planned because i have in ascension this month the next month in march i have selling to serantium and then something else i'm forgetting right now mm. someone's going to message me and tell me that they're mad at me for forgetting this uh, is what this is what you forgot. Have you read Infinite Jest, Jimmy? I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> I Listen, Sarah, I tried to start that book, and mm -hmm. I loved the first chapter. I thought the first chapter was dope. I loved mm -hmm. it. Got into the second chapter, and I'm like, yeah, it's Earth of the New Sun, Bell Tube. Thank you. That's the other one I was trying to read in March. Thank you. Yeah. Um, my eyes glazed over, and then I got the, the third one, and I was like, again, eyes glazed. And I'm like, you know what? And then I started looking up online, as you do when you're confused. And mm -hmm. people are like, you need to make sure you're taking notes. And then some people are like, don't take notes. That's stupid. And other people are like, you need to take notes unless you want to read it, this and that. And I'm like, I'm just going to – this is just too much. you know. I'm, wow. I'll stick the book of the new sun. That's a healthy amount of confusion for me that I like. Infinite Jest. I, have you read it? I haven't. This is one one of the like the big ones that I have on my shelf that I haven't read, but I do own it. It is yay big. Has it's reference so big. Back. I mean, it's if there's a book I was going to read that is not just like that, but I did read a good portion of that I really loved, and I just kind of fell out of it because I had other mm -hmm. stuff going on. Is House of Leaves? I actually really liked House of Leaves. Right. Uh, I think the core story of House of Leaves is really interesting. It just requires literally all of your attention. Like I found myself not being able to read other books when I was reading it, so I put that off. So that's like a challenging book that is purposely kind of complicated, right? That right. I'm I'm okay with because I like the the general story. With Infinite Jest, there was just something about it that like didn't pull me in, I guess would be the thing. I, again, chapter one, I really liked outside of that. I was, I was very, very lost. You so know, it's really excellent it, opening chapters. So we're to cut you off. You continue. Yeah. And I was going to say, if you, like it, if you like it, I'll, I'll, I'll hear you out, but who has good right. opening chapters? Cause I also have someone who has good opening chapters. Adrian Tchaikovsky has excellent opening chapters. So I have read two books by him that have like some of the best opening chapters that I have read and they went in two very different directions. So the book East of Eden, I think is the name of the book. It's the one like the multi, it's got multiple universes. That is the like, yeah, plot line of the book. Like, yeah. But it starts off as these two friends, these two high school friends who are cryptid hunters. So they go looking for like fake monsters, like, you know, mm -hmm. Bigfoot and stuff like that. And they get a tip off about one that shows up on somebody's doors of Eden. There we go. East of Eden. That's Steinbeck. Excellent yeah. book. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely much better than doors of Eden. Steinbeck. <laughs> Who did he ever be? Um, but it is such a cool and compelling opening chapter. Sadly, the rest of the book kind of went downhill for me. And I just uh, read the first Shadows of the Apt book, Empire in Black and Gold. Mm -hmm amazing first chapter it has an excellent excellent first chapter and uh i did end up liking that book so it did it did follow through but i i think that he's got a good good hook like he has these really high concept ideas and the first chapters seem to like really pull you in and then it's a bit of a toss-up how it's gonna go but amazing first chapters yeah, I uh, I really liked the first chapter of Cage of Souls, and I ended up souring on that book. But then I really liked Children of Time throughout the whole thing. Uh, yes. So I, I 
I think all of his premises sound interesting for every single one of his stories. He has good ideas. Absolutely. Uh, I think whether I'll like all of them, probably a, a mixed bag at best for how much he publishes and how different everything that he writes seems to be. Uh, I will tell you the person who I think opens up books almost better than anybody. Mm -hmm. And I'm not a huge fan of the series. Like I think it's okay. Dresden. I think Jim butcher is phenomenal. I would even up it and be like first scene. Like he is oh. the master of the opening scene. Like the first couple paragraphs are like, Whoa, I am in it. I, I am telling you, I think that Jim butcher, if I had to pick somebody to start the opening of a book, it might be Jim butcher. And, and again, I'm pretty middle of the road on Dresden. Uh, I've taken a nine month hiatus and I don't know when I'll ever get back uh, to it. And I know you really like Dresden. I love Dresden. Um, yeah. But I, man, that guy can, can hook you. I also think Glenn cook is exceptional at beginnings of the black company books that I've read. Uh, and he also has great endings. It's the middle that drags the belly a bit, but he's also another person, man. They just know how to hook you out of the gate. Uh, Tchaikovsky is someone I want to read more of. Empire of Black and Gold is one. I, I see so many people love the beginning, and then I feel like I never really hear many people talk about the ending of it. Yeah, same. It's 10 books, too. That's a lot. But the first, the people told me the first arc is four, so that's what I have committed myself to at this time. Is the that's first what Alan four. read, right? He read the first four, and he, he really liked them. Oh, Beltsube asks, Sarah, have you read the Alex verse of uh, Varus <laughs> always say verses uh, Varus books, very similar Dresden, but set in London. I haven't, but people have recommended it, have recommended them to me. And also a friend sent me um, a couple, the first couple monster hunter international books and said that those also have a Dresden feel like the same kind of mm -hmm. um, like urban fantasy kind of twist. I will say that urban fantasy is not at large, something that appeals to me. I really, I, I don't know what, the perfect combination was for Dresden. I think it was just like spending so much time with the same characters and mm -hmm. having such a good time reading them along with everybody else. Like I think Dresden might be the magic and other urban fantasy is not ever really going to be the biggest appeal, have the biggest appeal for me, but I, I do like Dresden. Yeah. Yeah. Urban fantasy is something I, I'm open to because I think uh, just like, you know, fantasy in general can be done very, very widely. Uh, a lot of people call David Mitchell urban fantasy, and I love that. Now, some people argue that's just magical realism, but those people smell their own farts. So I'm not, <laughs> not going to argue semantics with those people. But uh, there's a trilogy that you mentioned, and I know Alan read it as well, uh, and you guys both read it at the same time. And it's one that I've really been meaning to get to, but I would love for you to talk about it a little bit because I don't ever hear many people talk about it besides well, you and Alan and a few others is uh, the Re Risen Kingdom series. Yes, the Curtis Curtis Craddock. Craddock. I always forget if there's a. I always forget if there's an R in there or not. Yeah, I yeah, it's Craddock, and I own all three of them, but I just have not been able to read it yet. <laughs> I did really like them. So this is another thing is that steampunk is not always the biggest pull, like pull for me. I know it is the thing that Alan is looking for when he goes out. Like that's the, kind of the, the next great one that, that he's looking for. Um, but it is not always the most appealing to me because I like swords and magic and not necessarily like blimps and guns. Mm -hmm. But I did like that series. I thought that the relationship between the main character and her Gar he's not even really her guardian but like her male mentor he's kind of like a father figure it's not her father but he is the person who cares for her the most uh -huh. so well done it's really hard to do a relationship or i feel that a lot of male authors find it very hard to create a relationship between an older man and a younger woman without making it paternalistic or condescending and it's not he is mm. very much her support. He is there to help her. He appreciates her. He recognizes her strengths. He trusts her. He's not trying to like, he is protecting her, but he's not trying to shield her from the world. And that was the thing that I enjoyed the most about that series. I, the second book in the series was personally my favorite. And I thought that there were some really cool things that happened in that one, but I, uh, I did enjoy the series overall, but the, that relationship was kind of the biggest thing for me. That was, I really appreciated that part. Yeah. It seems like a series that I could enjoy that. I just haven't heard much about, which I'm, I'm kind of looking for because I've read a lot of the big names and I'm, I'm reading stuff and nothing's, nothing's really hitting. Does it have multiple POVs? It follows 
it's, it's I, if I remember correctly, I think it's just an omniscient narration and there's not like no. chapters are not separated out into POVs, but we do follow different people at different places. So the POVs okay. do, do split, yeah. but it's not, they're not chaptered POVs like Game of Thrones, but you do follow separate characters throughout the, the series. Very cool. Yeah, I feel like I've been reading so many first person chronicling tales that I need a little bit of a break from it. Like I'm kind of wanting that multiple POV uh, fantasy read. And I am reading The Waking Fire by Anthony Ryan, which is book one in the Dr Draconis something okay. memory, I think, yeah. uh, which I heard someone describe it kind of as like Victorian era fantasy with maybe boats and dragons, I think is what I've heard. Uh, I'm only maybe 20% of the way through. And I gotta say, as someone who did not like the pariah, I am liking this book. It's not amazing. And it's not, yeah, it's, sorry, Draconis uh, Memoria. Memoria probably is how you actually say it. Thank you, Daniel. Um, I, I'm enjoying it. It's not the best thing I've ever read. And there is a certain aspect of Anthony Ryan's writing that I don't love because I feel like if he can find a way to make a word longer than five letters, he will do it no matter what it is. <laughs> and that bothers me. And I also don't think that the characters have very unique, like every, every character kind of like talks the same, which bothers mm -hmm. me a good amount, especially after reading stuff that doesn't do that. Yeah. But I really, really like the way he has the world set up. So there's different like, blood magic and the blood magic has different colors so it actually reminds me a good amount of like a wheel of time slash mistborn type nice. thing because like they're ingesting the blood and cool. then getting magical elements from whatever color blood it is right awesome. so it reminds you of the metals from mistborn which in my opinion is kind of a cool idea so it feels like anthony ryan's kind of taking that but there's like this big hubbub around getting this patent for a certain type of engine that's going to like bring in this new revolution like industrial mm -hmm. revolution but there's also this like mythic blood type out there or something like that that it's all kind of like murky at the beginning it's very media res but they're like going out to get it and you have this scoundrel guy who happens to be blood uh talented but he's having to work for the man now because his supplier for the blood got cut off all this crazy stuff I actually think it's pretty, pretty damn good. And it's been refreshing reading something with a multiple POV. And I knew I had to shoehorn that in tonight. I wanted to talk about it because <laughs> it was a, get that in there. <laughs> yeah, it was a Patreon pick. So I had no intention of reading it. And I did not really like the pariah that much, even though I conceded that I think it's actually probably a really good book, just not for me. Mm -hmm. So that's been kind of neat. And I don't ever hear anyone talk about The Waking Fire by Anthony Ryan. Thanks. Anthony Ryan. I actually never hear anyone talking about Anthony Ryan, which is crazy. People talk about Blood Song. Like, that's the one that... That's, that's the only one. Yeah, that's the only one that I... And even then, it seemed like that was a, like, three to four years ago thing. Like, everybody was talking about it at the time. But now there's not a lot of people who are talking about it any longer. Yeah, it's a guy who has sold a ton of books and ri written a bunch of books. And I feel like I just don't... I don't hear about him all that much. But if you go look at his books on Goodreads, tons and tons of reviews. And... Daniel cleared this up and I'm still figuring it out in the book, but it's different color dragons blood. They're not like taking uh -huh. each other's bloods. So just to clear that up. I'm always uh, up to read a dragon book. Yeah. It's steampunk misborn with dragons and there's oh. even boats and I don't like boats, but I kind of like the boat so far in this series. So <laughs> maybe I'm coming around. Uh, Taylor was also hesitant because she didn't enjoy the pariah. Yeah. Totally different than the pariah. Totally different. And like I said, it's not, perfect but it's a good time like i'm interested in what's going on which is always nice and also there's a female character that i really 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 like from the get-go oh, awesome that's cool. always nice yeah very very good lead character um well i've had you for almost two hours but i have one more question that's been on my mind since you returned okay. to book two you set out yearly goals mm -hmm. and you went over your accomplished goals yep and you set up new goals but you only picked five. How did you get to five goals? Like you had a little chart. It was very organized, but why five? Why not three? Well, because okay. it is how I like it. I like the way it looks on the page. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have the worst reasons for any how of the things that I do. So in, in my reading journal, the like way that I spread it out um, is I made like a little reading goals page. And I like on the page, I put one and a two and then a three in the middle and a four and a five. And I like the way it looks. It's aesthetically pleasing to me. So I then narrow, like I have a bunch of reading goals and then I just narrow them down to. So some don't make a cut just because they don't look good on page. Exactly. That's brutal. I'm a very I'm a discerning book journalist. 
I see. I feel, and, and Jared talks about this all the time, and so does Joanna about journaling and and all this stuff. And I tried it for like a week, and I, I kind of fell off with it. But I feel like reading goals are a good thing to have. But I, I don't like getting too caught up in numbers. That's my only thing. You you set an overall yeah. reading goal for the year, don't you? Like number one. I do, and it's really only just so I can keep up with it on Goodreads. Like I don't that that part is lesser for me. My the the main one that was different this year from other years is something that I. I don't usually do because as we, we were talking a little bit earlier about reading widely, like mm -hmm. I feel like I read widely in terms of genre. I read widely in terms of author. I, like there is not, there are not a lot of areas where I feel like, okay, I need to actively try to pick up this type of book or this type of author because I yeah. just naturally gravitate to a wide variety of stories. I like reading about lots of different things, mm -hmm. but I don't remember who asked me, but somebody had asked me for indigenous recommendations and it was not a booktube friend. It was like a real life friend. I was like, man, I don't have great options for this. Like, I don't have great answers for this, this question. And so as I was putting together the goals, I was like, this is one that I actually will make a goal for myself because I don't want to be asked questions that I don't have the answer to. That's a, that's a, that's a pet peeve of mine. I don't like not having the answer. Yeah, you like so, working informed. I, I understand. I, I do. I do. So I, uh, and I went to, in my book haul, I picked up a couple because chapters has like a little display of indigenous authors. And so I picked up a couple that looked pretty cool. Like the covers caught my eye and then I read them and saw what they were about and they, they looked pretty interesting. So I'm going to try. Yeah, I tend to also pick up variety, different authors from different backgrounds. So at least I, I, I wouldn't even say I try to, but it seems like it happens just because I like walking in other people's shoes and different exactly. styles. And, you know, it's, it, what's really interesting to me is whenever you read something from, you know, a different part of the world, not set in the same place or whatever, and then you get a whole list of inspirations that have been around for centuries that you didn't know about that inform that storytelling style. Uh, I know I can expect this with Marlon James's uh, uh book i always forget what it is it's like black leopard red wolf i think is yes. what it's called yeah. uh which i read the first 35 pages of that book and was thoroughly thoroughly confused uh yeah. what was going on and it's actually told in almost like a camp like i feel like someone would be telling me like folklore at a campfire it's kind of what it nice. felt like which is interesting uh but yeah i i tend to also wanted to spend some time in you know 1800s Russia, and then I want to go spend some time in, you know, Aztec time and Egypt. And that's that's one of the reasons why I'd like to read a little bit more historical fantasy as well. Uh, uh, historical fiction, I should say. Uh, there's really not a ton of fantasy that I know of that is actually set in some of the times that I'm interested in. One of the big ones that I'm going to be doing is um, uh, Wolf Hall. Yes. Uh, yes. Everyone says it's amazing. I know Jared loves it. Uh, Steve Donahue recommended it to me and it won the Pulitzer, I believe. Uh, it's supposed to be cover King Henry VIII and some of his trials and tribulation, which he's just a mess. So should be fun. Yes. It's from the point of view of his advisor, right? Like that's the that's the character that we follow. I don't know. I actually know almost nothing about it except for Amber Lynn's in there and also King Henry VIII. <laughs> that's, it. That's, it. that's all I know. And it's about yay thick. But I've yeah, heard it's, it's amazing. It's a big one. Yeah, I've all and Jared said that he feels like a lot of people who are into fantasy will appreciate a lot of the aspects of Wolf Hall. So I'm, you know, that'll be cool. I mean, I like historical fiction too. It's not my favorite. Um, I've had some duds, but I think I'll, I'll end up having a good time. But then, no, I did not finish Karamazov or Anna Karenina. But they're not <laughs> DNFs. Uh, they just have to. I have to be in the mood. But Anna Karenina from what I read was absolutely fantastic. Uh, Karamazov had grown on me. Actually, by the time I had clicked, I had decided that I didn't want to read it anymore. Uh, and I had to take a pause from it. But Karamazov, Karamaz, I always say it wrong. It doesn't matter. Uh, after the very first part, I, I started to enjoy it uh, quite a bit. Uh, it's also the beginning of a trilogy, so there is more to love. The POV... Thomas, Thomas Cromwell. Cromwell. It won the man booker. Okay. So it won the booker, not the Pulitzer. I apologize. Didn't all three of them win the booker or maybe the first two did. And then they were expecting the third one too. And then it didn't. I don't, I remember there was something about that. Either it, all of them won or two won. And then they were expecting the third two. And it was an upset. I, I don't remember. See, I'm slipping already. I, I can't go back on book jeopardy. <laughs> you can already not. messing stuff up. <laughs> and I have not read <laughs> Madame Bovary. Um, I've actually never heard of that. Uh, the fact that Wolf Hall is so two of them won the book, but the fact that it's a trilogy is actually 
I mean, if I love it, that's great. But I would like to read more standalones as po if, if possible. I've also been trying to finish some series up, which I'm doing a little bit of a better job of. I'm going to finish Richard Swan stuff, hopefully Era 2, mm -hmm. slowly but surely closing up like these 50 odd ongoing series. <laughs> you'll, you'll get there. It'll happen. I'll just keep drowning and flapping my arms around. You finished like, did you say you finished like seven series last year or something? I finished a bunch and I don't, I don't have a ton of open series. So I'm, it's pretty manageable actually. I think this year I'm going to make an even bigger dent in it. I'm so impressed by you. I mean, you really are organized if you're finishing that many series. I'm trying, I'm trying my best. I'm, I'm very jealous. I'm glad, <laughs> I'm glad you're back to booktube, Sarah. I'm also glad that you decided to join me here tonight. And I can't thank you enough for taking time away from your family and from reading and doing things for your own channel to come and hang out and catch up with me. It's been wonderful uh, talking to you. I hope that it doesn't take a year to get me you back too. on. Um, hopefully whatever I did is now forgiven for liking Brandon Sanderson a little bit. <laughs> Uh, to be bad, I've given Brandon Sanderson's books four stars. Like I'm not, I, like I said, I it is his writing that I don't enjoy, but he does the other stuff well enough that I'm like, you know what? I I did end up having a good time with this. I just, I just get a little bit fired up about his writing. I'm I think, sorry. I think it's wonderful that you've, you're trying to win him back. Is this where you announce the Patreon's opening? Is this, <laughs> this, is this is this where you do it? Wait for my Stormlight read through. That's oh. what that's what's coming. I mean, I, I'll tell you what, we talked about hype releases. I am hyped for Stormlight 5. God, I hope yeah. it's good. God, please, please be good. Oh, my God. I'm so nervous. <laughs> Fingers crossed. I have my sprint crossed, my toes crossed, every everything uh, crossed. Sarah, where can people find you on the Internet? So my channel is Sarah Reads. I link my Discord in all of my videos. Feel free to come in. Like I said, people keep it alive, and I show up sometimes and drop like 60 messages at once, just like my Goodreads reviews, which I do in batches of like 45, and then I become the like 20 <laughs> most active reviewer on Goodreads for a day. That's crazy. <laughs> do you write reviews for every book? I do. Yeah. And wow. I used to, before I was on booktube, I would write a dedicated review. Like I tried really hard to actually get all of my thoughts out there, but usually now it's just whatever I put in my reading journal because I do write a little review when I finish every book in my journal. And so that's how I can go back and do like batches of like 50 because I'm like, Oh, okay. There, there we go. There's the information that I was thinking at the time. Yeah. I, I never write reviews very often. If I do, it's usually like some cruddy one word review. That's like garbage. I'll put like nice. <laughs> I'll just put nice. <laughs> I think one time, I think it was sort of my last, but I just put, whoa, <laughs> I'm like, I'm just going to be, cause like on my channel, I try to be very thoughtful and like nuanced and I'm like on Goodreads, it's all memes. Uh, amazing. Um, I love it. Well, everyone is super excited to have you back. So everyone, you, if you're everyone. not subscribed to Sarah, you should go over there. Sarah does read a great variety of things. She is also into manga, if you're into that, which is always great. Uh, and she is just one of the best people that I've got to meet through this. So Sarah, thank you again for spending your Friday night with me. Thank you for having me. Anytime. You're always welcome. And folks, thanks for being the third guest here on Chatty Boom Notes. You can hit like if you liked it. If you hated everything we talked about, you can smash the dislike button if you'd like. And if you loved it and it's your first time here, I'd love to see you subscribe. Uh, we do these every two weeks roughly. And I will be doing some girly reading vlogs in the future that you might or may not want to check out as well. There is that juicy Patreon in the description. It's optional, but always appreciated. Until we see you next time, be good, be safe. And please remember to always keep turning the page.